The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling Mowgli's Brothers It was seven o'clock of a very warm evening in the Sioni Hills when Father Wolf woke up from his day's rest, scratched himself, yawned, and spread out his paws one after the other to get rid of the sleepy feeling in their tips. Mother Wolf lay with her big grey nose, dropped across her four tumbling, squealing cubs, and the moon shone into the mouth of the cave where they all lived. It's time to hunt again, said Father Wolf, and he was going to spring downhill, when suddenly, from the valley below, that ran down to a little river, he heard the dry, angry, snarly, sing-song whine of a tiger, who has caught nothing, and does not care if all the jungle knows it. The fool, said Father Wolf, to begin a night's work with that noise. Does Sheer Khan think that our buck are like his fat Wangunga bullocks? Shere Khan's mother did not call him Lungri, the lame one for nothing, said Mother Wolf quietly. He has been lame in one foot from his birth. That is why he has only killed cattle. But it is neither bullock nor buck he hunts tonight. It is man. The wine had changed to a sort of humming purr that seemed to come from every quarter of the compass. It was the noise that bewilders woodcutters and gypsies sleeping in the open, and makes them run sometimes into the very mouth of the tiger. Man, said Father Wolf, showing all his white teeth. Ah, are there not enough beetles and frogs that he must eat, man? And on our ground, too? The law of the jungle, which never ordered anything without a reason, forbids every beast to eat man, except when he's killing to show his children how to kill, and then he must hunt outside the hunting grounds of his pack or tribe. The reason the beasts give among themselves is that man is the weakest and most defenseless of all living things, and it is unsportsmanlike to touch him. But the real reason is that man-killing means, sooner or later, the arrival of white men on elephants with guns, and hundreds of brown men with gongs and rockets and torches. Then everybody in the jungle suffers. The purr outside grew louder, and ended in the full-throated, of the tiger's charge. Then there was a howl, an untigerish howl, from Shere Khan. He has missed, said Mother Wolf. Father Wolf ran out a few paces and heard Shere Khan muttering and mumbling savagely as he tumbled about in the scrub. The fool has had no more sense than to jump at a woodcutter's campfire and has burned his feet, said Father Wolf with a grunt. Something is coming uphill, said Mother Wolf, twitching one ear. Get ready. The bushes rustled a little in the thicket, and Father Wolf dropped with his haunches under him, ready for his leap. Then, if you had been watching, you would have seen the most wonderful thing in the world. The wolf checked in mid-spring. He made his bound before he saw what it was he was jumping at, and then he tried to stop himself. The result was that he shot up straight into the air for four or five feet, landing almost where he left ground. Man, he snapped. A man's cub. Look. Directly in front of him, holding on by a low branch, stood a naked brown baby who could just walk, as soft and as dimpled a little atom as ever came to a wolf's cave at night. He looked up into Father Wolf's face and laughed. Is that a man's cub? said Mother Wolf. I've never seen one. Bring it here. A wolf accustomed to moving his own cubs can, if necessary, mouth an egg without breaking it. And though Father Wolf's jaws closed right on the child's back, not a tooth even scratched the skin as he laid it down among the cubs. How little, how naked, and how bold, said Mother Wolf softly. The baby was pushing his way between the cubs to get close to the warm hide. Ah, hi! He is taking his meal with the others. And so this is a man's cub. Now, was there ever a wolf that could boast of a man's cub among her children? I've heard now and again of such a thing, but never in our pack or in my time, said Father Wolf. He's altogether without hair, and I could kill him with a touch of my foot. But see, he looks up 
and is not afraid. Suddenly, the moonlight was blocked out of the mouth of the cave. For sheer Khan's great square head and shoulders were thrust into the entrance. Shere Khan does us great honor, said Father Wolf, but his eyes were very angry. What does Shere Khan need? My quarry, a man's cub went this way, said Shere Khan. Its parents have run off, give it to me. Shere Khan had jumped at a woodcutter's campfire, as Father Wolf had said, and was furious from the pain of his burned feet. But Father Wolf knew that the mouth of the cave was too narrow for a tiger to come in by. Even where he was, Shere Khan's shoulders and forepaws were cramped for want of room, as a man's would be if he tried to fight in a barrel. The wolves are a free people, said Father Wolf. They take orders from the head of the pack, and not from any striped cattle killer. The man's cub is ours, to kill if we choose. What talk is this of choosing? Am I to stand nosing into your dog's den for my fair dues? The tiger's roar filled the cave with thunder. Mother Wolf shook herself clear of the cubs and sprang forward, her eyes like two green moons in the darkness, facing the blazing eyes of Shere Khan. It is I, Rakshar the demon, who answers. The man's cub is mine, Lungri. He shall not be killed. He shall live to run with a pack and to hunt with a pack. And in the end, look you, hunter of little naked cubs, he shall hunt thee. Now get hence, or back thou goest to thy mother, lamer than ever thou camest into the world. Go! Shere Khan might have faced Father Wolf, but he could not stand up against Mother Wolf, for he knew that where he was, she had all the advantage of the ground and would fight to the death. So he backed out of the cave mouth growling, and when he was clear he shouted, Each dog barks in his own backyard. We will see what the pack will say to this fostering of man-cubs. The cub is mine, and to my teeth he will come in the end. Mother Wolf threw herself down, panting among the cubs, and Father Wolf said to her gravely, Shere Khan, speaks this much truth. The cub must be shown to the pack. Wilt thou still keep him, mother? Keep him, she gasped. He came naked by night, alone and very hungry, yet he was not afraid. Look, he's pushed one of my babes to one side already, and that lame butcher would have killed him and would have run off to the Wangunga while the villagers here hunted through all our lairs in revenge. Keep him? Assuredly I will keep him. Lie still, little frog, for Mowgli, the frog I will call thee. The time will come when thou wilt hunt Shere Khan, as he has hunted thee. But what will our pack say, said Father Wolf? The law of the jungle lays down very clearly that any wolf may, when he marries, withdraw from the pack he belongs to. But as soon as his cubs are old enough to stand on their feet, he must bring them to the pack council, which is generally held once a month at full moon in order that the other wolves may identify them. After that inspection, the cubs are free to run where they please, and until they have killed their first buck, no excuse is accepted if a grown wolf of the pack kills one of them. The punishment is death where the murderer can be found. Father Wolf waited till his cubs could run a little, and then, on the night of the pack meeting, took them and Mowgli and Mother Wolf to the Council Rock, a hilltop covered with stones and boulders where a hundred wolves could hide. Akela, the great grey lone wolf, who led all the pack by strength and cunning, lay out at full length on his rock, and below him sat forty or more wolves of every size and colour, from badger-coloured veterans who could handle a buck alone to young black three-year-olds who thought they could. The lone wolf had led them for a year now, there was very little talking at the rock. The cubs tumbled over each other in the centre of the circle where their mothers and fathers sat, and now and again a senior wolf would go quietly up to a cub, look at him carefully, and return to his place on noiseless feet. Sometimes a mother would push her cub far out into the moonlight to be sure that he'd not been overlooked. Father Wolf pushed Mowgli the Frog, as they called him, into the centre, where he sat laughing and playing with some pebbles that glistened in the moonlight. A muffled roar came up from behind the rocks. The voice of Shere Khan, crying, 
The cub is mine. Give him to me. What have the free people to do with a man's cub? Akela never even twitched his ears. All he said was, Look well, O wolves. What have the free people to do with the orders of any, save the free people? Look well. There was a chorus of deep growls, and a young wolf in his fourth year flung back Shere Khan's question to Akela. What have the free people to do with a man's cub? Now the law of the jungle lays down that if there is any dispute as to the right of a cub to be accepted by the pack, he must be spoken for by at least two members of the pack who are not his father and mother. Who speaks for this cub? said Akela. Among the free people, who speaks? Then, the only other creature who is allowed at the pack council, Baloo, the sleepy brown bear who teaches the wolf cubs the law of the jungle, rose up on his hindquarters and grunted. I speak for the man's cub, he said. There is no harm in a man's cub. Let him run with a pack and be entered with the others. I myself will teach him. We need yet another, said Akela. Baloo has spoken, and he is our teacher for the young cubs. Who speaks besides Baloo? A black shadow dropped down into the circle. It was Bagheera, the black panther. Inky black all over, but with a panther marking showing up in certain lights like the pattern of watered silk. Everybody knew Bagheera and nobody cared to cross his path. But he had a voice, as soft as wild honey dripping from a tree, and a skin softer than down. O oh, Akela, and ye the free people, he purred, I have no right in your assembly, but the law of the jungle says that if there is a doubt which is not a killing matter in regard to a new cub, the life of that cub may be bought at a price, and the law does not say who may or may not pay that price. Am I right? Good, good, said the young wolves, who are always hungry. Listen to Bagheera. A cub can be bought for a price. It is the law. To kill a naked cub is a shame, said Bagheera. Besides, he may make better sport for you when he's grown. Baloo has spoken in his behalf. Now to Baloo's word, I will add one bull and a fat one, newly killed, not half a mile from here, if ye will accept the man's cub according to the law. There was a clamour of scores of voices saying, Let him run with a pack! Where is the bull, Bagheera? Let him be accepted! And then came Akela's deep bay, crying, Look well! Look well, O wolves! Mowgli was still deeply interested in the pebbles, and he did not notice when the wolves came and looked at him one by one. At last, they all went down the hill for the dead bull, and only Akela, Bagheera, Baloo, and Mowgli's own wolves were left. Shere Khan roared still in the night, for he was very angry that Mowgli had not been handed over to him. Aye, roar well, said Bagheera under his whiskers. For the time comes when this naked thing will make thee roar to another tune, or I know nothing of man. It was well done, said Akela. Men and their cubs are very wise. He may be a help in time. Akela was thinking of the time that comes to every leader of every pack when his strength goes from him and he gets feebler and feebler, till at last... He is killed by the wolves, and a new leader comes up. Take him away, he said to Father Wolf, and train him as befits one of the free people. And that is how Mowgli was entered into the Sioni wolf pack at the price of a bull and on Baloo's good word. Mowgli grew up with the cubs, though they, of course, were grown wolves almost before he was a child and Father Wolf taught him his business and the meaning of things in the jungle, till every rustle in the grass, every breath of the warm night air, every note of the owls above his head, every scratch of a bat's claws as it roosted for a while in a tree, and every splash of every little fish jumping in a pool meant just as much to him 
as the work of his office means to a businessman. When he was not learning, he sat out in the sun and slept, and ate, and went to sleep again. When he felt dirty or hot, he swam in the forest pools, and when he wanted honey, he climbed up into the trees for it, and that Bagheera showed him how to do. He took his place at the Council Rock, too, when the pack met, and there he discovered that if he stared hard at any wolf, the wolf would be forced to drop his eyes, and so he used to stare for fun. At other times, he would pick the long thorns out of the pads of his friends, for wolves suffer terribly from thorns and burrs in their coats. He would go down the hillside into the cultivated lands by night and look very curiously at the villagers in their huts. But he had a mistrust of men, because Bagheera showed him a square box with a drop gate so cunningly hidden in the jungle that he nearly walked into it and told him that it was a trap. He loved better than anything else to go with Bagheera into the dark warm heart of the forest, to sleep all through the drowsy day, and at night to see how Bagheera did his killing. Bagheera killed right and left as he felt hungry, and so did Mowgli. And he grew and grew, strong as a boy must grow who does not know that he is learning any lessons and who has nothing in the world to think of except things to eat. Mother Wolf told him once or twice that Shere Khan was not a creature to be trusted, and that some day he must kill him. But though a young wolf would have remembered that advice every hour, Mowgli forgot it because he was only a boy, though he would have called himself a wolf if he'd been able to speak in any human tongue. Shere Khan was always crossing his path in the jungle, for as Akela grew older and feebler, the lame tiger had come to be great friends with the younger wolves of the pack who followed him for scraps, a thing that Akela would never have allowed if he dared to push his authority to the proper bounds. Then Shere Khan would flatter them and wonder that such fine young hunters were content to be led by a dying wolf and a man's cub. They tell me... Shere Khan would say, that at council ye dare not look him between the eyes. And the young wolves would growl and bristle. Ten years passed quickly, and then on one very warm day, a new notion came to Bagheera, born of something that he'd heard. He said to Mowgli, Little brother, how often have I told thee that Shere Khan is thy enemy? As many times as there are nuts on that palm, said Mowgli, who naturally could not count. What of it? Shere Khan is all long tail and loud talk, like Mayo the peacock. Little brother, Shere Khan dare not kill thee in the jungle. But remember, Akela is very old, and soon the day comes when he cannot kill his buck, and then he will be leader no more. Many of the wolves that looked thee over when thou wast brought to the council first are too old, and the young wolves believe, as Shere Khan has taught them, that a man-cub has no place with the pack. In a little time thou wilt be a man. And what is a man that he should not run with his brothers? said Mowgli. I was born in the jungle. I have obeyed the law of the jungle, and there is no wolf of ours from whose paws I have not pulled a thorn. Surely they're, they're my brothers. Bagheera stretched himself at full length and half shut his eyes. Little brother, said he, feel under my jaw. Mowgli put up his strong brown hand, and just under Bagheera's silky chin, where the giant rolling muscles were all hid by the glossy hair, he came upon a little bald spot. There is no one in the jungle that knows that I, Bagheera, carry that mark. The mark of the collar. I was born among men, and it was among men that my mother died in the cages of the king's palace at Udipur. It was because of this that I paid the price for thee at the council when thou wast a little naked cub. Bagheera paused for a moment and then continued, Yes, I too was born among men. They fed me behind bars from an iron pan, till one night I felt that I was Bagheera the panther, and no man's plaything, and I broke the silly lock with one blow of my paw and came away. 
thou art a man's cub. And even as I return to my jungle, so thou must go back to men at last, to the men who are thy brothers, if thou art not killed in the council. But why should any wish to kill me? said Mowgli. Look at me, said Bagheera. And Mowgli looked at him steadily between the eyes. The big panther turned his head away in half a minute. That is why, he said, shifting his paw on the leaves. Not even I can look thee between the eyes, and I was born among men, and I love thee, little brother. The others, they hate thee, because their eyes cannot meet thine, because thou art wise, because thou hast pulled out thorns from their feet, because thou art a man. I did not know these things, said Mowgli sullenly, and he frowned under his heavy black eyebrows. It is in my heart, said Bagheera, that when Akela misses his next kill, and at each hunt it costs him more to pin the buck, the pack will turn against him and against thee. This is what thou must do. Mowgli listened carefully. Go down quickly to the men's huts in the valley, and take some of the red flower which they grow there, so that when the time comes thou mayst have even a stronger friend than I, or Baloo, or those of the pack that love thee. By red flower, Bagheera meant fire. Only no creature in the jungle will call fire by its proper name. Every beast lives in deadly fear of it, and invents a hundred ways of describing it. The red flower, said Mowgli, that grows outside their huts in the twilight. I will get some. <laughs> there speaks the man's cub, said Bagheera proudly. Remember that it grows in little pots. Get one swiftly and keep it by thee for time of need. Good, said Mowgli. I go. And he bounded away. <laughs> that is a man. That is all a man, said Bagheera to himself. Oh, Shere Khan, never was a blacker hunting than that frog hunt of thine ten years ago. Mowgli was far through the forest, running hard, and his heart was hot in him. As the evening mists began to rise, he plunged downward through the bushes to the stream at the bottom of the valley and into the croplands where the villagers lived. He came into the village and crept up to a hut on the outskirts. Then he pressed his face close to the window and watched the fire on the hearth. He saw the husbandman's wife get up and feed it with black lumps, and when the morning came and the mists were all white and cold, he saw the man's child pick up a wicker pot plastered inside with earth, fill it with lumps of red-hot charcoal and go out to tend the cows in the byre. He strode round the corner and met the boy, took the pot from his hand and disappeared into the mist while the boy howled with fear. They are very like me, he said, blowing into the pot as he'd seen the woman do. This thing will die if I do not give it things to eat. And he dropped twigs and dried bark on the red stuff. Halfway up the hill he met Bagheera with a morning dew shining like moonstones on his coat. A Kayla has missed, said the panther. They would have killed him last night but they needed thee also. They were looking for thee on the hill. I was among the ploughed lands. I'm ready. See? Mowgli held up the fire pot. All that day, Mowgli sat in the cave, tending his fire pot and dipping dry branches into it to see how they looked. He found a branch that satisfied him, and in the evening he went to the council. Akela the lone wolf lay by the side of his rock as a sign that the leadership of the pack was open. And Shere Khan, with his following of scrap-fed wolves, walked to and fro openly, being flattered. Bagheera lay close to Mowgli, and the firepot was between Mowgli's knees. When they were all gathered together, Shere Khan began to speak, a thing he would never have dared to do when Akela was in his prime. He has no right, whispered Bagheera. Say so. He is a dog's son. He will be frightened. Mowgli sprang to his feet. Free people, he cried. 
Does Shere Khan lead the pack? What has a tiger to do with our leadership? Seeing that the leadership is yet open and being asked to speak, Shere Khan began. By whom, said Mowgli, are we all jackals to fall on this cattle butcher? The leadership of the pack is with the pack alone. Akela raised his old head wearily. Free people, and ye too, jackals of Shere Khan, for many seasons I have led ye to and from the kill, and in all my time not one has been trapped or maimed. Now I have missed my kill. Ye know how that plot was made. Ye know how he brought me up to an untried buck to make my weakness known. It was cleverly done. Your right is to kill me here on the Council Rock now. Therefore, I ask, who comes to make an end of the lone wolf? For it is my right, by the law of the jungle, that ye come one by one. There was a long hush, for no single wolf cared to fight Akela to the death. Then Shere Khan roared, Ugh, What have we to do with this toothless old fool? He's doomed to die. It is the man-cub who has lived too long. Free people, he was my meat from the first. Give him to me. He's troubled the jungle for ten seasons. He is a man, a man's child, and from the marrow of my body. Bones, I hate him. Then more than half the pack yelled, A man, a man, what has a man to do with us? Let him go to his own place. And turn all the people of the villages against us. Clamoured Shere Khan, no, give him to me. Akela lifted his head again and said, He has eaten our food. He has slept with us. He's driven game for us. He has broken no word of the law of the jungle. He's a man, snarled the pack, and most of the wolves began to gather round Shere Khan, whose tail was beginning to twitch. Now the business is in thy hands, said Bagheera to Mowgli. We can do no more except fight. Mowgli stood upright, the fire pot in his hands. Then he stretched out his arms and yawned in the face of the council. But he was furious with rage and sorrow, for wolf-like, the wolves had never told him how they hated him. "'There is no need for this dog's jabber,' he cried. "'Ye have told me so often tonight that I am a man, and indeed I would have been a wolf with you to my life's end, that I feel your words are true. So I do not call you my brothers any more, but dogs, as a man should.' What ye will do and what ye will not do is not yours to say. The matter is with me, and that we may see the matter more plainly, I, the man, have brought here a little of the red flower which ye, dogs, fear. He flung the fire pot on the ground, and some of the red coals lit a tuft of dried moss that flared up as all the council drew back in terror before the leaping flames. Mowgli thrust his dead branch into the fire till the twigs lit and crackled, and whirled it above his head among the cowering wolves. Good, he said, staring round slowly. I see that ye are dogs. I go from you to my own people, but I will be more merciful than ye are, because I was all but your brother in blood. I promise that when I am a man among men, I will not betray ye to men as ye have betrayed me. He kicked the fire with his foot, and the sparks flew up. But here is a debt to pay before I go. He strode forward to where Shere Khan sat blinking stupidly at the flames, and caught him by the tuft on his chin. Bagheera followed in case of accidents. Up, dog, Mowgli cried, up when a man speaks, or I will set that coat ablaze. Shere Khan's ears lay flat back on his head, and he shut his eyes, for the blazing branch was very near. This cattle killer said he would kill me in the council because he'd not killed me when I was a cub. Thus do we beat dogs when we are men. He beat Shere Khan over the head with a branch, and the tiger whimpered and whined in an agony of fear. Go now, singed jungle cat, but remember when next I come to the council rock, 
as a man should come. It will be with sheer Khan's hide on my head. For the rest, a Kaler goes free to live as he pleases. Ye will not kill him, because that is not my will. Nor do I think that ye will sit here any longer, lolling out your tongues as though ye were somebody's, instead of dogs whom I drive out thus. Go! The fire was burning furiously at the end of the branch, and Mowgli struck right and left round the circle, and the wolves ran howling with the sparks burning their fur. At last there were only Akela, Bagheera, and perhaps ten wolves that had taken Mowgli's part. Then something began to hurt Mowgli inside him, as he'd never been hurt in his life before, and he caught his breath and sobbed and the tears ran down his face. What is it, he said. I do not wish to leave the jungle, and I, I do not know what this is. Now thou art a man, said Bagheera, and a man's cub no longer. Mowgli sat and cried as though his heart would break, and he had never cried in all his life before. Now, he said, I will go to men. But first I must say farewell to my mother. And he went to the cave where she lived with Father Wolf, and he cried on her coat, while the four cubs howled miserably. You will not forget me, said Mowgli. Never while we can follow a trail, said the cubs. Come to the foot of the hill when thou art a man, and we will talk to thee, and we will come into the croplands to play with thee by night. Come soon, said Father Wolf. Oh, wise little frog, come again soon, for we be old, thy mother and I. Come soon, said Mother Wolf, little naked son of mine, for I love thee more than I ever loved my cubs. I will surely come, said Mowgli. And when I come, it will be to lay out Shere Khan's hide upon the Council Rock. Do not forget me. Tell them in the jungle never to forget me. The dawn was beginning to break when Mowgli went down the hillside alone to meet those mysterious things that are called men. Cars Hunting all that is told here happened some time before Mowgli was turned out of the Sioni wolfpack in the days when Baloo was teaching him the law of the jungle. The big, serious old brown bear was delighted to have so quick a pupil, for the young wolves will only learn as much of the law of the jungle as applies to their own pack and tribe. But Mowgli, as a man-cub, had to learn a great deal more. Sometimes, Bagheera, the black panther, would come lounging through the jungle to see how his pet was getting on, and would purr with his head against a tree while Mowgli recited the day's lesson to Baloo. The boy could climb almost as well as he could swim, and swim almost as well as he could run. So Baloo, the teacher of the law, taught him the wood and water laws, how to tell a rotten branch from a sound one, how to speak politely to the wild bees when he came upon a hive, what to say to Mang the Bat when he disturbed him in the branches at midday, and how to warn the water snakes in the pools before he splashed down among them. Then, too, Mowgli was taught the stranger's hunting call, which must be repeated aloud till it is answered. Whenever one of the jungle people hunts outside his own grounds, it means, translated, give me leave to hunt here because I am hungry, and the answer is, hunt then for food, but not for pleasure. All this will show you how much Mowgli had to learn by heart, and he grew very tired of saying the same thing over a hundred times. But, as Baloo said to Bagheera one day when Mowgli had been cuffed and was in a bad temper, a man-cub is a man-cub, and he must learn all the law of the jungle. No one then is to be feared. Mm. Except his own tribe, said Bagheera under his breath. And then, aloud to Mowgli, he said, Have a care for my ribs, little brother. What is all this dancing up and down? Mowgli had been trying to make himself heard by pulling at Bagheera's shoulder fur and kicking hard. 
When the two listened to him, he was shouting at the top of his voice, One day I shall have a tribe of my own and lead them through the branches all day long. <laughs> what is this new folly, little dreamer of dreams, said Bagheera. I shall throw branches and dirt at old Baloo, Mowgli went on. They have promised me this. Baloo's big paw scooped Mowgli off Bagheera's back, and as the boy lay between the big forepaws, he could see the bear was angry. Mowgli, said Baloo, thou hast been talking with the monkey people. Mowgli looked at Bagheera to see if the panther was angry too, and Bagheera's eyes were as hard as jade stones. What well, they gave me nuts and pleasant things to eat, said Mowgli, and they carried me in their arms up to the top of the trees and said I was their blood brother, except that I had no tail and should be their leader some day. They have no leader, said Bagheera. They lie. They have always lied. They were very kind and bade me come again. Why have I never been taken among the monkey people? They stand on their feet as I do. They do not hit me with hard paws. Listen, man-cub, said the bear, and his voice rumbled like thunder on a hot night. I have taught thee all the law of the jungle for all the peoples of the jungle, except the monkey folk who live in the trees. They have no law. They are outcasts. They have no speech of their own, but use the stolen words which they overhear when they listen and peep and wait up above in the branches. Their way is not our way. They are without leaders. They boast and chatter and pretend that they are a great people about to do great affairs in the jungle. But the falling of a nut turns their minds to laughter and all is forgotten. We of the jungle have no dealings with them. We do not drink where the monkeys drink. We do not go where the monkeys go. We do not hunt where they hunt. They are very many evil, dirty, shameless, and they desire, if they have any fixed desire, to be noticed by the jungle people. But we do not notice them, even when they throw nuts and filth on our heads. He'd hardly spoken when a shower of nuts and twigs spattered down through the branches. They could hear coughings and howlings and angry jumpings high up in the air among the thin branches. The two trotted away, taking Mowgli with them. What Baloo had said about the monkeys was perfectly true. They belonged to the treetops, and as beasts very seldom look up, there was no occasion for the monkeys and the jungle people to cross each other's path. But whenever they found a sick wolf, or a wounded tiger or bear, the monkeys would torment him, and would throw sticks and nuts at any beast for fun, and in the hope of being noticed. They were always just going to have a leader, and laws, and customs of their own. But they never did, because their memories would not hold over from day to day. None of the beasts could reach them, but on the other hand, none of the beasts would notice them. And that was why they were so pleased when Mowgli came to play with them, and they heard how angry Baloo was. They never meant to do any more, but one of them invented what seemed to him a brilliant idea, and he told all the others that Mowgli would be a useful person to keep in the tribe, because he could weave sticks together for protection from the wind. So if they caught him they could make him teach them. This time, they said, they were really going to have a leader and become the wisest people in the jungle. Therefore, they followed Baloo and Bagheera and Mowgli through the jungle very quietly till it was time for the midday nap. Mowgli, who was very much ashamed of himself, slept between the panther and the bear, resolving to have no more to do with the monkey people. The next thing he remembered was feeling hands on his legs and arms, hard, strong little hands, and then a swash of branches in his face. And then he was staring down through the swaying boughs as Baloo woke the jungle with his deep cries and Bagheera bounded up the trunk with every tooth bared. The monkey people howled with triumph and scuffled away to the upper branches where Bagheera dared not follow. Then they began their flight and the flight of the monkey people through treeland is one of the things nobody can describe. They have their regular roads and crossroads, up hills and down hills, all laid out from fifty to a hundred feet above ground, and by these they can travel even at night if necessary. 
two of the strongest monkeys caught Mowgli under the arms and swung off with him through the treetops twenty feet at a bound. Crashing and whooping and yelling, the whole tribe swept along the tree roads with Mowgli their prisoner. For a time, he was afraid of being dropped. Then he grew angry, but knew better than to struggle. And then he began to think. The first thing was to send back word to Baloo and Bagheera, for at the pace the monkeys were going, he knew his friends would be left far behind. It was useless to look down, for he could only see the top sides of the branches. So he stared upward and saw, far away in the blue, Cheel the kite, balancing and wheeling as he kept watch over the jungle, waiting for things to die. Cheel saw the monkeys were carrying something, and dropped a few hundred yards to find out whether their load was good to eat. He whistled with surprise when he saw Mowgli being dragged up to a treetop and heard him give the kite call for, We be of one blood, thou and I. The waves of the branches closed over the boy, but Cheel balanced away to the next tree in time to see the little brown face come up again. Mark my trail, Mowgli shouted. Tell Baloo of the Sioni pack and Bagheera of the Council Rock. Mark my trail. The last words were shrieked as he was being swung through the air, but Chill nodded and rose up till he looked no bigger than a speck of dust, and there he hung, watching with his telescope eyes the swaying of the treetops as Mowgli's escort whirled along. Meantime, Baloo and Bagheera were furious with rage and grief. Haste, oh haste, we may catch them yet, panted poor Baloo, who'd set off at a clumsy trot in the hope of overtaking the monkeys. At that speed, said Bagheera, this is no time for chasing. Let us make a plan. They may drop him if we follow too close. Oh, Mowgli, Mowgli, why did I not warn thee against the monkey folk, moaned Baloo. Unless and until they drop him from the branches in sport, or kill him out of idleness, said Bagheera, I have no fear for the man-cub. He's wise and well taught, and above all, he has the eyes that make the jungle people afraid. But he is in the power of the monkey people, and they, because they live in trees, have no fear of any of our people. Oh, fool that I am, said Baloo suddenly. It is true what Hutty, the wild elephant, says. To each his own fear. And the monkey people do fear Ka, the rock snake. He can climb as well as they can. He steals the young monkeys in the night. The whisper of his name makes their wicked tales cold. Let us go to Ka. Oh, what will he do for us? He's not of our tribe, being footless and with most evil eyes, said Bagheera. Oh, he's very old and very cunning. Above all, he's always hungry, said Baloo hopefully. Promise him many goats. Baloo rubbed his faded brown shoulder against the panther, and they went off to look for Ka, the rock python. They found him stretched out on a warm ledge in the afternoon sun, darting his big blunt-nosed head along the ground and twisting the thirty feet of his body into fantastic knots and curves and licking his lips as he thought of his dinner to come. He has not eaten, said Baloo with a grunt of relief. Be careful, Bagheera. He's a little blind and very quick to strike. Carr was not a poison snake, in fact, he rather despised the poison snakes as cowards. But his strength lay in his hug, and when he'd once lapped his huge coils round any body, there was no more to be said. Good hunting, cried Baloo, sitting up on his haunches. Like all snakes of his breed, Carr was rather deaf and did not hear the call at first. Then he curled up ready for any accident. His head lowered. Good hunting for us all, he answered. Is there any news of game afoot? We are hunting, said Baloo carelessly. He knew that you must not hurry, Carr. 
A blow more or less is nothing to thee, said Carr. But I have to wait for days in a wood path and climb half a night on the mere chance of a young ape. I came very near to falling on my last hunt, very near indeed, and the noise of my slipping, for my tail was not tight wrapped round the tree, waked the monkey people, and they called me most evil names. Footless yellow earthworm, said Bagheera under his whiskers, as though he were trying to remember something. Have they ever called me that? said Carr. Oh, um, something of that kind it was that they shouted to us last moon, but we never noticed them. They will say anything, even that thou hast lost all thy teeth, and wilt not face anything bigger than a kid, because thou art afraid of the he-goat's horns. Bagheera went on sweetly. Now a snake, especially a wary old python like Carr, very seldom shows that he's angry. But Baloo and Bagheera could see the big swallowing muscles on either side of Carr's throat ripple and bulge. It is the monkey people that we follow now, said Baloo. Beyond doubt, then, it is no small thing that takes two such hunters on the trail of the monkey folk, Carr replied as he swelled with curiosity. The trouble is this, Carr. Those nut-stealers and pickers of palm-leaves have stolen away our man-cub, of whom thou hast perhaps heard, said the Black Panther. I heard some news from Iki the porcupine of a man-thing that was entered into a wolf-pack, but I did not believe. Iki is full of stories half-heard and very badly told. But it is true. He is such a man-cub as never was, said Baloo, the best and wisest and boldest of man-cubs, my own pupil, who shall make the name of Baloo famous through all the jungles. And besides, I... we... love him. Ka. Our man-cub is in the hands of the monkey people now, said Bagheera, and we know that of all the jungle people they fear Ka alone. They have good reason, said Carr. Now whither went they with the cub? The jungle alone knows it towards the sunset, I believe, said Baloo. We thought that thou wouldst know, Carr. I? How? I take them when they come in my way, but I do not hunt them. Up, up, up! Hello, hello, hello! Look up, Baloo of the Sioni Wolf Pack! Baloo looked up to see where the voice came from, and there was Cheel the Kite, sweeping down with the sun shining on the upturned flanges of his wings. It was near Chill's bedtime, but he'd ranged all over the jungle looking for the bear and had missed him in the thick foliage. What is it? said Baloo. I've seen Mowgli among the monkey people. He bade me tell you I watched. The monkey people have taken him beyond the river to the monkey city, to the cold lairs. Good hunting, all you below. Full gorge and a deep sleep to you, Chill, cried Bagheera. I will remember thee in my next kill and put aside the head for thee alone, O best of kites. It is nothing. The boy held the master word. I could have done no less and Chiu circled up again to his roost. Oh, he's not forgotten to use his tongue, said Baloo with a chuckle of pride. To think of one so young remembering the master word for the birds too while he was being pulled across trees. Now we must go to the cold lairs. They knew where that place was, but few of the jungle people ever went there because what they call the cold lairs was an old deserted city, lost and buried in the jungle, and beasts seldom use a place that men have once used. Besides, the monkeys lived there, as much as they could be said to live anywhere, and no self-respecting animal would come within eyeshot of it, except in times of drought, when the half-ruined tanks and reservoirs held a little water. It is half a night's journey at full speed, said Bagheera, and Baloo looked very serious. Well, I, I will go as fast as I can, said the bear anxiously. We dare not wait for thee. Follow, Baloo. We must go on the quick foot, Carr and I. Baloo made one effort to hurry, but had to sit down panting. 
and so they left him to come on later. In the cold lairs, the monkey people were not thinking of Mowgli's friends at all. They'd brought the boy to the lost city and were very pleased with themselves for the time. Mowgli had never seen an Indian city before, and though this was almost a heap of ruins, it seemed very wonderful and splendid. Some king had built it long ago on a little hill. Trees had grown into and out of the walls, the battlements were tumbled down and decayed, and wild creepers hung out of the windows of the towers in bushy hanging clumps. There was a ruined summer house of white marble in the centre of the terrace, built for queens, dead a hundred years ago. The domed roof had half fallen in and blocked up the underground passage from the palace by which the queens used to enter. The walls were made of screens of marble tracery, and as the moon came up behind the hill, it shone through the openwork, casting shadows on the ground like black velvet embroidery. Sore, sleepy, and hungry as he was, Mowgli could not help laughing when the monkey people began, twenty at a time, to tell him how great and wise and strong and gentle they were, and how foolish he was to wish to leave them. We are the most wonderful people in all the jungle, they shouted. Now, as you are a new listener and can carry our words back to the jungle people so that they may notice us in future, we will tell you all about our most excellent selves. Mowgli made no objection, and the monkeys gathered by hundreds and hundreds on the terrace to listen to their own speakers singing the praises of the monkey people. And whenever a speaker stopped for want of breath, they would all shout together, This is true. We all say so. Mowgli nodded and blinked and said, Yes when they asked him a question, and his head spun with a noise. Do they never go to sleep, he said to himself. Now there is a cloud coming to cover that moon. If it were only a big enough cloud, I might try to run away in the darkness. And that same cloud was being watched by two good friends in the ruined ditch below the city wall. For Bagheera and Carr, knowing well how dangerous the monkey people were in large numbers, did not wish to run any risks. The monkeys never fight unless there are a hundred to one, and few in the jungle care for those odds. I will go to the west wall, Carr whispered, and come down swiftly with the slope of the ground in my favour. Mm, would that Baloo were here, said Bagheera. But we must do what we can. When that cloud covers the moon, I shall go to the terrace. They hold some sort of council there, over the boy. Good hunting, said Carr grimly, and glided away to the west wall. That happened to be the least ruined of any, and the big snake was delayed a while before he could find a way up the stones. The cloud hid the moon, and as Mowgli wondered what would come next, he heard Bagheera's light feet on the terrace. The Black Panther had raced up the slope almost without a sound and was striking right and left among the monkeys who were seated round Mowgli in circles of fifty and sixty deep. There was a howl of fright and rage, and then, as Bagheera tripped on the rolling, kicking bodies beneath him, a monkey shouted, There is only one here! Kill him! Kill him! A scuffling mass of monkeys, biting, scratching, tearing and pulling, closed over Bagheera, while five or six laid hold of Mowgli, dragging him up the wall of the summer house and pushed him through the hole of the broken dome. A man-trained boy would have been badly bruised, for the fall was a good fifteen feet, but Mowgli fell as Baloo had taught him to fall, and landed on his feet. "'Stay there!' shouted the monkeys, "'till we've killed thy friend, and later we will play with thee, if the poison people leave thee alive.' "'We be of one blood, ye and I,' said Mowgli, quickly giving the snake's call. He could hear rustling and hissing in the rubbish all round him, and gave the call a second time to make sure. "'Even so, down hoods all,' said half a dozen low voices. "'Every ruin in India becomes sooner or later a dwelling place of snakes, and the old summer house was alive with cobras. "'Stand still, little brother, for thy feet may do us harm.' Mowgli stood as quietly as he could, peering through the openwork and listening to the furious din of the fight round the Black Panther, the yells and chatterings and scufflings and Bagheera's deep hoarse cough as he backed and bucked and twisted and plunged under the heaps of his enemies. 
for the first time since he was born, Bagheera was fighting for his life. Baloo must be at hand. Bagheera would not have come alone, Mowgli thought, and then he called aloud. To the tank, Bagheera! Roll to the water tank! Roll and plunge! Get to the water! Bagheera heard, and the cry that told him Mowgli was safe gave him new courage. He worked his way desperately, inch by inch, straight for the reservoirs, hitting in silence. Then, from the ruined wall nearest the jungle, rose up the rumbling war shout of Baloo. Bagheera! he shouted. I am here! He panted up the terrace only to disappear to the head in a wave of monkeys but he threw himself squarely on his haunches and, spreading out his forepaws, hugged as many as he could hold and then began to hit with a regular bat, 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 like the flipping strokes of a paddle wheel. A crash and a splash told Mowgli that Bagheera had fought his way to the tank where the monkeys could not follow. The panther lay gasping for breath, his head just out of water, while the monkey stood three deep on the red steps, dancing up and down with rage, ready to spring upon him from all sides if he came out to help Baloo. Carr had only just worked his way over the west wall, landing with a wrench that dislodged a coping stone into the ditch. He had no intention of losing any advantage of the ground, and called and uncalled himself once or twice to be sure that every foot of his long body was in working order. Then he came straight, quickly, and anxious to kill. The fighting strength of a python is in the driving blow of the head, backed by all the strength and weight of his body. If you can imagine a lance, or a battering ram, or a hammer, weighing nearly half a ton, driven by a cool, quiet mind living in the handle of it, you can roughly imagine what Carr was like when he fought. A python, four or five feet long, can knock a man down if he hits him fairly in the chest. And Carr was thirty feet long. His first stroke was delivered into the heart of the crowd round Baloo, and there was no need of a second. The monkeys scattered with cries of, Car! It is Car! Run! Run! Car was everything that the monkeys feared in the jungle. They ran, stammering with terror through the walls and the roofs of the houses, and Baloo drew a deep breath of relief. His fur was much thicker than Bagheera's, but he'd suffered sorely in the fight. Bagheera came up from the tank, shaking his wet sides. The monkeys leaped higher up the walls. They clung round the necks of the big stone idols and shrieked as they skipped along the battlements. Let us take the man-cub and go, Bagheera gasped. They may attack again. Ka, we owe thee, I think, our lives, Bagheera and I, said Baloo. No matter. Where is the manling? Here, in a trap. I cannot climb out, cried Mowgli. The curve of the broken dome was above his head. Take him away, said the cobblers inside. He dances like Mayo the peacock. He will crush our young. Ah, said Carr with a chuckle. He has friends everywhere. Stand back, manling, and hide you, O oh poison people. I break down the wall. Carr looked carefully till he found a discoloured crack in the marble tracery showing a weak spot. He made two or three light taps with his head to get the distance, and then, lifting up six feet of his body clear of the ground, sent home half a dozen full power, smashing blows, nose first. The screenwork broke and fell away in a cloud of dust and rubbish, and Mowgli leaped through the opening and flung himself between Baloo and Bagheera, an arm round each big neck. So this is the manling, said Carr. Very soft is his skin, and he is not so unlike the monkey people. Have a care, manling, that I do not mistake thee for a monkey some twilight when I have newly changed my coat. We be of one blood, thou and I, Mowgli answered. I take my life from thee tonight. My kill shall be thy kill, if ever thou art hungry, O Carr. A brave heart and a courteous tongue, said Carr. They shall carry thee far through the jungle, manling. But now 
Go hence quickly with thy friends. The moon was sinking behind the hills as the three slipped off through a gap in the walls to the jungle. Now, said Bagheera, jump on my back, little brother, and we will go home. Mowgli laid his head down on Bagheera's back and slept so deeply that he never waked when he was put down by Mother Wolf's side in the home cave. Tiger, Tiger Now we must go back to the first tale. When Mowgli left the wolf's cave after the fight with a pack of the Council Rock, he went down to the ploughed lands where the villagers lived, but he would not stop there, because it was too near to the jungle, and he knew that he'd made at least one bad enemy at the council. So he hurried on, keeping to the rough road that ran down the valley, and followed it at a steady jog trot for nearly twenty miles, till he came to a country that he did not know. The valley opened out into a great plain, dotted over with rocks and cut up by ravines. At one end stood a little village, and at the other the thick jungle came down in a sweep to the grazing grounds. When Mowgli came to the village gate, he saw the big thorn bush that was drawn up before the gate at twilight pushed to one side. He sat down by the gate, and when a man came out, he stood up, opened his mouth, and pointed down it to show that he wanted food. The man stared, and ran back up the one street of the village shouting for the priest, who was a big fat man dressed in white with a red and yellow mark on his forehead. The priest came to the gate and with him at least a hundred people, who stared and talked and shouted and pointed at Mowgli. "'What is there to be afraid of?' said the priest. "'Look at the marks on his arms and legs. They are the bites of wolves. He is but a wolf-child run away from the jungle.' Of course, in playing together, the cubs had often nipped Mowgli harder than they intended, and there were white scars all over his arms and legs. But he would have been the last person in the world to call these bites— for he knew what real biting meant. "'By my honour, Meswa,' said two or three women together, "'he is not unlike thy boy that was taken by the tiger.' "'Let me look,' said a woman with heavy copper rings on her wrists and ankles, and she peered at Mowgli under the palm of her hand. "'Indeed, he has the very look of my boy.' The priest was a clever man, and he knew that Meswa was wife to the richest villager in the place. So he looked up at the sky for a minute and said solemnly, What the jungle has taken, the jungle has restored. Take the boy into thy house, my sister, and forget not to honour the priest who sees so far into the lives of men. The crowd parted as the woman beckoned mildly to her hut, where there was a red lacquered bedstead, a great earthen grain chest with curious raised patterns on it, half a dozen copper cooking pots, and an image of a Hindu god in a little alcove. She gave him a long drink of milk and some bread, and then she laid her hand on his head and looked into his eyes. Natu, oh Natu, she said. Mowgli did not show that he knew the name. Dost thou not remember the day when I gave thee thy new shoes? She touched his foot and it was almost as hard as horn. Mowgli was uneasy, because he'd never been under a roof before, but as he looked at the thatch he saw that he could tear it out at any time if he wanted to get away, and that the window had no fastenings. "'What is the good of a man?' he said to himself at last, "'if he does not understand man's talk. Now I am as silly and dumb as a man would be with us in the jungle. I must learn their talk.' So as soon as Meswa pronounced a word, Mowgli would imitate it almost perfectly, and before dark he'd learned the names of many things in the hut. There was difficulty at bedtime, because Mowgli would not sleep under anything that looked so like a panther trap as that hut, and when they shut the door he went through the window. "'Give him his will,' said Meswa's husband. "'Remember, he can never till now have slept on a bed.' So Mowgli stretched himself in some long, clean grass at the edge of the field, but before he'd closed his eyes, a soft, grey nose poked him under the chin. Phew, said Grey Brother. 
He was the eldest of Mother Wolf's cubs. This is a poor reward for following thee twenty miles. Thou smellest of wood smoke and cattle, altogether like a man already. Wake, little brother, I bring news. Are all well in the jungle? said Mowgli, hugging him. All except the wolves that were burned with the red flower. Now listen. Shere Khan has gone away to hunt far off till his coat grows again, for he's badly singed. When he returns, he swears that he will lay thy bones in the Wangunga. I also have made a little promise, said Mowgli, but news is always good. I'm tired tonight, very tired with new things, Grey Brother, but bring me the news always. Thou wilt not forget that thou art a wolf, said Grey Brother anxiously. Never. I will always remember that I love thee and all in our cave. But also, I will always remember that I have been cast out of the pack. And that thou mayest be cast out of another pack. When I come down here again, I will wait for thee in the bamboos at the edge of the grazing ground. For three months after that night, Mowgli hardly ever left the village gate. He was so busy learning the ways and customs of men. First he had to wear a cloth round him, which annoyed him horribly, and then he had to learn about money, which he did not in the least understand, and about ploughing, of which he did not see the use. One evening the priest told Meswa's husband that Mowgli had better be set to work as soon as possible, and the village headman told Mowgli that he would have to go out with the buffaloes next day and herd them while they grazed. No one was more pleased than Mowgli, and that night, because he'd been appointed, as it were, a servant of the village, he went off to a circle that met every evening on a masonry platform under a great fig tree. It was the village club, where the headman and the watchman and the barber and old Buldu, the village hunter, who owned a tower musket, met and smoked. They told wonderful tales of gods and men and ghosts, and Buldu told even more wonderful ones of the ways of beasts in the jungle, till the eyes of the children, sitting outside the circle, bulged out of their heads. Mowgli, who naturally knew something about what they were talking of, had to cover his face, not to show that he was laughing, while Buldu, the tower musket across his knees, climbed on from one wonderful story to another, and Mowgli's shoulders shook. Buldu was explaining how the tiger that had carried away Meswa's son was a ghost tiger, and his body was inhabited by the ghost of a wicked old moneylender who died some years ago. And I know that this is true, he said, because Purundas always limped from the blow that he got in a riot when his account books were burned. And the tiger that I speak of, he limps too, for the tracks of his pads are unequal. That tiger limps because he was born lame, as everyone knows, said Mowgli. To talk of the soul of a moneylender in a beast that never had the courage of a jackal is child's talk. Oh, it is the jungle brat, is it? said Buldu. If thou art so wise, better bring his hide to Kaniwara, for the government has set a hundred rupees on his life. Better still, do not talk when thy elders speak. Mowgli rose to go. All the evening I've lain here listening, he called back over his shoulder, and except once or twice, Buldu has not said one word of truth concerning the jungle, which is at his very doors. Buldu puffed and snorted at Mowgli's impertinence. The next morning at dawn, Mowgli went through the village street, sitting on the back of Rama, the great herd bull, and the slaty-blue buffaloes, with their long, backward-sweeping horns and savage eyes, rose out of their byres one by one and followed him. Mowgli drove them on to the edge of the plain where the Waingunga River came out of the jungle, and then he dropped from Rama's neck, trotted off to a bamboo clump, and found Grey Brother. Ah, oh, said Grey Brother, I've waited here very many days. What's the meaning of this cattle-herding work? I am a village herd for a while, said Mowgli. What news of Shere Khan? He's come back to this country, and has waited here a long time for thee. Now he's gone off again, for the game is scarce, but he means to kill thee. Very good, said Mowgli. 
So long as he's away, do thou or one of the four brothers sit on that rock, so that I can see thee as I come out of the village. When he comes back, wait for me in the ravine by the dak tree in the center of the plain. We need not walk into Shere Khan's mouth. Over the next few weeks, Mowgli would lead the buffaloes out to their wallows, and day after day he would see Grey Brother's back a mile and a half away across the plain, so he knew that Shere Khan had not come back. And day after day he would lie on the grass listening to the noises round him and dreaming of old days in the jungle. At last, a day came when he did not see Grey Brother at the signal place, and he laughed and headed the buffaloes for the ravine by the duck tree, which was all covered with gold and red flowers. There sat Grey Brother, every bristle on his back lifted. He's hidden for a month to throw thee off thy guard. He crossed the ranges last night, hot foot on thy trail, said the wolf. His plan is to wait for thee at the village gate this evening, for thee and for no one else. He is lying up now in the big dry ravine of the Weingunga. Has he eaten today, or does he hunt empty? said Mowgli, for the answer meant life or death to him. Uh, he killed at dawn a pig, and he's drunk too. Uh, remember, Shere Khan could never fast, even for the sake of revenge. Hmm. Eaten and drunk. And he thinks that I shall wait till he has slept. If there were but ten of us, we might pull him down as he lies. These buffaloes will not charge unless they wind him and I cannot speak their language. Can we get behind his track so they may smell it? Oh, he swam far down the Weingunga to cut that off, said Grey Brother. Mowgli stood with his finger in his mouth, thinking. The big ravine of the Weingunga that opens out on the plain not half a mile from here. I can take the herd round through the jungle to the head of the ravine and then sweep down but he would slink out at the foot. We must block that end. Grey brother, canst thou cut the herd in two for me? Well, not I alone, but uh, I've brought a wise helper. Grey brother trotted off and dropped into a hole. Then there lifted up a huge grey head that Mowgli knew well, and the hot air was filled with the most desolate cry of all the jungle, the hunting howl of a wolf at midday. Oh, a Kayla, said Mowgli, clapping his hands. I might have known that thou wouldst not forget me. We have big work in hand. Cut the herd in two, a Kayla. Keep the cows and calves together, and the bulls and the plough buffaloes by themselves. The two wolves ran in and out of the herd, which snorted and threw up its head, and separated into two clumps. In one, the cow buffaloes stood, with their calves in the centre, and glared and pawed ready, if a wolf would only stay still, to charge down and trample the life out of him. In the other, the bulls and the young bulls snorted and stamped. Though they looked more imposing, they were much less dangerous, for they had no calves to protect. No six men could have divided the herd so neatly. Mowgli slipped onto Rama's back. Drive the bulls away to the left, Akela. Grey brother, when we're gone, hold the cows together and drive them into the foot of the ravine. Keep them there till we come down. Mowgli's plan was simple enough. All he wanted to do was to make a big circle uphill and get at the head of the ravine, and then take the bulls down it and catch Shere Khan between the bulls and the cows, for he knew that after a meal and a full drink, Shere Khan would not be in any condition to fight or to clamber up the sides of the ravine. It was a long, long circle, for they did not wish to get too near the ravine and give Shere Khan warning. At last, Mowgli rounded up the bewildered herd at the head of the ravine on a grassy patch that sloped steeply down to the ravine itself. From that height, you could see across the tops of the trees down to the plain below. But what Mowgli looked at was the sides of the ravine, and he saw, with a great deal of satisfaction, that they ran nearly straight up and down, while the vines and creepers that hung over them would give no foothold to a tiger who wanted to get out. Let them breathe, Akela, 
he said, holding up his hand. They've not winded him yet. I must tell Shere Khan who comes. We have him in the trap. He put his hands to his mouth and shouted down the ravine, and the echoes jumped from rock to rock. After a long time, there came back the drawling, sleepy snarl of a full-fed tiger just wakened. Who calls? I, Mowgli, cattle thief, it is time to come to the council rock. Down, hurry them down, Akela. Down, Rama, down. The herd paused for an instant at the edge of the slope, but Akela gave tongue in the full hunting yell, and they pitched over one after the other, just as steamers shoot rapids, the sand and stones spurting up around them. Once started, there was no chance of stopping, and before they were fairly in the bed of the ravine, Rama winded Shere Khan and bellowed. Ha <laughs> ha! said Mowgli on his back, and the torrent of black horns, foaming muzzles, and staring eyes whirled down the ravine like boulders in flood time. They knew what the business was before them, the terrible charge of the buffalo herd, against which no tiger can hope to stand. Shere Khan heard the thunder of their hoofs, picked himself up, and lumbered down the ravine looking from side to side for some way to escape. But the walls of the ravine were straight, and he had to keep on, heavy with his dinner and his drink, willing to do anything rather than fight. The herd splashed through the pool he'd just left, bellowing till the narrow cut rang. Mowgli heard an answering bellow from the foot of the ravine, saw Shere Khan turn. The tiger knew if the worst came to the worst, it was better to meet the bulls and the cows with their calves. And then Rama tripped, stumbled, and went on again, over something soft. And with the bulls at his heels, crashed full into the other herd. Quick, Akela, break them up, scatter them, or they'll be fighting one another. Softly now, softly, my children, it is all over. Akela and Grey Brother ran to and fro, nipping the buffalo's legs, and though the herd wheeled once to charge up the ravine again, Mowgli managed to turn Rama, and the others followed him to the wallows. Shere Khan needed no more trampling. He was dead, and the kites were coming for him already. Brothers, that was a dog's death, said Mowgli feeling for the knife he always carried in a sheath round his neck, and now that he lived with men. But he would never have shown fight. His hide will look well on the council rock. We must get to work swiftly. A boy trained among men would never have dreamed of skinning a ten-foot tiger alone, but Mowgli knew better than anyone else how an animal's skin is fitted on, and how it can be taken off. But it was hard work, and Mowgli slashed and tore and grunted for an hour. Presently, a hand fell on his shoulder, and looking up, he saw Buldu with a tower musket. The children had told the village about the buffalo stampede, and Buldu went out angrily, only too anxious to correct Mowgli for not taking better care of the herd. The wolves dropped out of sight as soon as they saw the man coming. "'What is this folly?' said Buldu angrily. "'To think that thou canst skin a tiger. Where did the buffaloes kill him?' It is the lame tiger, too, and there is a hundred rupees on his head. Well, well, we will overlook thy letting the herd run off, and perhaps I will give thee one of the rupees on the reward when I have taken the skin to Kaniwara. So thou wilt take the hide to Kaniwara for the reward, and perhaps give me one rupee, said Mowgli. Now it is in my mind that I need the skin for my own use. What talk is this to the chief hunter of the village? Mowgli? I will not give thee one anna of the reward, but only a very big beating. Leave the carcass. Akela, said Mowgli, this man plagues me. Buldu found himself sprawling on the grass with a grey wolf standing over him, while Mowgli went on skinning as though he were alone in all India. <laughs> to do Buldu justice, if he'd been ten years younger, he would have taken his chance with Akela had he met the wolf in the woods. But a wolf who obeyed the orders of a boy was not a common animal. It was sorcery, magic of the worst kind, thought Buldu. He lay as still as still, expecting every minute to see Mowgli turn into a tiger too. Maharaj, great king, 
he said at last in a husky whisper. I am an old man. I did not know that thou wast anything more than a herd boy. May I rise up and go away, or will thy servant tear me to pieces? Go, and peace go with thee. Only another time, do not meddle with my game. Let him go, Akela. Buldu hobbled away to the village as fast as he could, and when he arrived, he told a tale of magic and enchantment and sorcery that made the priest look very grave. Mowgli went on with his work, but it was nearly twilight before he and the wolves had drawn the great skin clear of the body. Now we must hide this and take the buffaloes home. Help me to herd them, Akela. The herd rounded up in the misty twilight, and when they got near the village, Mowgli saw lights and heard the conches and bells blowing and banging. Half the village seemed to be waiting for him by the gate, and a shower of stones whistled about his ears. The villagers shouted, Sorcerer! Wolf sprat! Jungle demon! Go away! Shoot, Buldu! Shoot! The old tower musket went off with a bang, and a young buffalo bellowed in pain. More sorcery! shouted the villagers. He can turn bullets! Buldu! That was thy buffalo! Meswa ran across to the herd and cried, Oh, my son, my son, they say thou art a sorcerer who can turn himself into a beast at will. I do not believe, but go away or they will kill thee. Buldu says thou art a wizard. Mowgli laughed a little short, ugly laugh. <laughs> Run back, Meswa. This is one of the foolish tales they tell under the big tree at dusk. Farewell. And run quickly, for I shall send the herd in more swiftly than their brickbats. I am no wizard, Meswa. Farewell. The buffaloes were anxious enough to get to the village. They hardly needed Akela's yell, but charged through the gate like a whirlwind, scattering the crowd right and left. Fare you well, children of men, shouted Mowgli scornfully, and thank Meswa that I do not come in with my wolves and hunt you up and down your street. He turned on his heel and walked away with the lone wolf. And as he looked up at the stars, he felt happy. No more sleeping in traps for me. Let us get Shere Khan's skin and go away, Akela. The moon was just going down when Mowgli and the two wolves came to the hill of the Council Rock, and they stopped at Mother Wolf's cave. They've cast me out from the man pack, Mother, shouted Mowgli. But I come with the hide of Shere Khan to keep my word. Mother Wolf walked stiffly from the cave with the cubs behind her, and her eyes glowed as she saw the skin. I told him on that day when he crammed his head and shoulders into this cave, hunting for thy life, little frog. I told him that the hunter would be the hunted. It is well done, little brother. It is well done, said a deep voice in the thicket. We were lonely in the jungle without thee. And Bagheera came running to Mowgli's bare feet. They clambered up the council rock together, and Mowgli spread the skin out on the flat stone where Akela used to sit, and Akela lay down upon it, and called the old call to the council. Look! Look well, O oh wolves! exactly as he'd called when Mowgli was first brought there. The pack came to the Council Rock and saw Shere Khan's striped hide on the rock and the huge claws dangling at the end of empty feet. Look well, O oh wolves! Have I kept my word? said Mowgli. And the wolves bayed, Yes! And one tattered wolf howled, Lead us again, Akela. Lead us again, man-cub. For we be sick of this lawlessness, and we would be the free people once more. Nay, purred Bagheera, that may not be. When ye are full-fed, the madness may come upon ye again. Not for nothing are ye called the free people. Ye fought for freedom, and it is yours. Eat it, O wolves. Man-pack and wolf-pack have cast me out, said Mowgli. Now I will hunt alone in the jungle. 
and we will hunt with thee, said the four cubs. So Mowgli went away and hunted with the four cubs in the jungle from that day on. Letting in the jungle It is not easy to change one's life all in a minute, particularly in the jungle. The first thing Mowgli did when the pack had slunk off was to go to the home cave and sleep for a day and a night. Then he told Mother Wolf and Father Wolf as much as they could understand of his adventures among men, and Baloo toiled up the hill to hear all about it, and Bagheera scratched himself all over with pure delight at the way in which Mowgli had managed his war. Mowgli, his head on Mother Wolf's side, smiled contentedly, and said that for his own part he never wished to see or hear or smell man again. But what? said Akela, cocking one ear. But what if men do not leave thee alone, little brother? Mowgli looked at him questioningly. When that yellow thief's hide was hung up on the rock, Akela went on, I went back along our trail to the village, stepping in my tracks, turning aside, lying down, to make a mixed trail in case one should follow us. But when I'd fouled the trail so that I myself hardly knew it again, Mang the bat came hawking between the trees and hung up above me. Said Mang, The village of the man-pack, where they cast out the man-cub, hums like a hornet's nest. He said that the red flower blossomed at the gate of the village and men sat about it carrying guns. Now I know that men do not carry guns for pleasure. Presently, little brother, a man with a gun follows our trail, if indeed he be not already on it. But why should he? said Mowgli angrily. Men have cast me out. What more do they need? Thou art a man, little brother, Akela replied. It is not for us, the free hunters, to tell thee what thy brethren do, or why. Suddenly, Bagheera sprang to his feet, thrust up his head as far as he could, sniffed, and stiffened through every curve in his body. Grey Brother followed his example quickly, keeping a little to his left to get the wind that was blowing from the right, while Akela bounded fifty yards upwind and, half crouching, stiffened too. Man, Akela growled, dropping on his haunches. Buldu, said Mowgli, sitting down. He follows our trail. Come, let us see what this man means toward us. And followed by the others, he cut across noiselessly through the jungle at right angles to Buldu's path, till parting the undergrowth, he saw the old man, his musket on his shoulder, running up the trail of overnight at a dog trot. Presently, Buldu came to where Akela had gone back and mixed it all up. Then he sat down and coughed and grunted and made little casts around and about into the jungle to pick it up again. And all the time he could have thrown a stone over those who were watching him. Then a little knot of charcoal burners came down the path and naturally halted to speak to Buldu, whose fame as a hunter reached for at least twenty miles around. They all sat down and smoked and Bagheera and the others came up and watched, while Buldu began to tell the story of Mowgli, the devil child, from one end to another, with additions and inventions. He told how he himself had really killed Shere Khan, and how Mowgli had turned himself into a wolf, and fought with him all the afternoon, and changed into a boy again, and bewitched Buldu's rifle, so that the bullet turned the corner when he pointed it at Mowgli and how the village, knowing him to be the bravest hunter in Sioni, had sent him out to kill this devil child. But meantime, the village had got hold of Meswa and her husband, who were undoubtedly the father and mother of this devil child, and had barricaded them in their own hut, and presently would make them confess they were witch and wizard, and then they would be burned to death. Buldu said that nothing would be done till he returned, because the village wished him to kill the jungle boy first. 
They did not happen to have seen anything of such a creature. The charcoal burners looked round cautiously and thanked their stars that they had not. But they had no doubt that so brave a man as Buldu would find him if anyone could. The sun was getting rather low, and they had an idea that they would push on to Buldu's village and see that wicked witch. Buldu said that, though it was his duty to kill the devil child, he could not think of letting a party of unarmed men go through the jungle, which might produce the wolf demon at any minute, without his escort. He, therefore, would accompany them, and if the sorcerer's child appeared, well, he would show them how the best hunter in Sioni dealt with such things. What says he? The wolves asked Mowgli every few minutes, and Mowgli translated until he came to the witch part of the story, which was a little beyond him, and then he said that the man and woman who'd been so kind to him were trapped. Does man trap man? said Bagheera. So he says, I cannot understand the talk. I must look to this. Whatever they would do to Meswa, they will not do till Buldu returns. I go hot foot back to the man pack. And those, said Grey Brother, looking hungrily after the brown backs of the charcoal burners. Sing them home, said Mowgli with a grin. I do not wish them to be at the village gates till it is dark. Sing to them, lest they be lonely on the road. And, uh, Grey Brother, the song need not be of the sweetest. Go with them, Bagheera, and help make that song. When night is shut down, meet me by the village. Grey Brother knows the place. Bagheera lowered his head so that the sound would travel, and cried a long, long, Good hunting! A midnight call in the afternoon. Mowgli heard it rumble and rise and fall and die off in a creepy sort of whine behind him and laughed to himself as he ran through the jungle. He could see the charcoal burners huddled in a knot, old Buldu's gun barrel waving like a banana leaf to every point of the compass at once. It was twilight when he saw the well-remembered grazing ground and the dak tree where Grey Brother had waited for him on the morning that he killed Shere Khan. Angry as he was at the whole breed and community of man, something jumped up in his throat and made him catch his breath when he looked at the village roofs. He noticed that everyone had come in from the fields unusually early, and that instead of getting to their evening cooking, they gathered in a crowd under the village tree and chattered and shouted. He crept along outside the wall till he came to Meswa's hut and looked through the window into the room. There lay Meswa, gagged and bound hand and foot, breathing hard and groaning. Her husband was tied to the bedstead. So he went in through the window and, stooping over the man and woman, cut their thongs and pulled out their gags. Meswa was half wild with pain and fear, and Mowgli put his hand over her mouth just in time to stop a scream. Oh, I knew he would come. She sobbed at last, and she hugged Mowgli to her heart. Why are these thongs? Why have they tied thee, he asked. To be put to the death for making a son of thee. What else? said the man sullenly. Look, I bleed. Meswa said nothing. But it was at her wounds that Mowgli looked and they heard him grit his teeth when he saw the blood. "'Whose work is this?' said he. "'There is a price to pay. "'Because thou wast my son,' said Meswa timidly, "'whom the tiger took, and because I loved thee very dearly. "'They said that I was the mother of a devil, and therefore worthy of death.' "'Yonder is the road to the jungle,' said Mowgli, pointing through the window. Your hands and feet are free. Go now. We do not know the jungle, Meswa said. I do not think that I could walk far. And the men and women would be upon our backs and drag us here again, said the husband. I have no wish to do harm to anyone of this village, said Mowgli, but I do not think they will stay thee. In a little while they will have much else to think upon. Ah! He lifted his head and listened to shouting and trampling outside. So they've let Buldu come home at last. 
He was sent out to kill thee, Meswa cried. Didst thou meet him? Oh, yes, I met him. He has a tale to tell, and while he's telling it, there is time to do much. Think where ye may go. Kaniwara is thirty miles from here, said Meswa, but there we may find the English. And what pack are they? asked Mowgli. I do not know. They be white, and it is said that they govern all the land, and do not suffer people to burn or beat each other with, without witnesses. If we can get thither tonight, we live. Otherwise we die. Live, then. No man passes the gates tonight. Mowgli helped Messworth through the window, and the cool night air revived her. But the jungle in the starlight looked very dark and terrible. Remember now not to be afraid, and there is no need to go quickly, but there may be some small singing in the jungle behind you and before. However, not a tooth in the jungle will be bared against you. Neither man nor beast shall stay you till you come within eyeshot of Kaniwara. Mowgli glanced at the man and said to Meswa, He does not believe. He will be afraid when he hears my people singing. Thou wilt know and understand. Go now. Meswa and her husband crept away towards the jungle, and as Meswa urged her husband forward, and the darkness shut down on them, Bagheera rose up, almost under Mowgli's feet, trembling with delight of the night that drives the jungle people wild. Is it killing at last? he whispered, as he climbed softly through the window. Mowgli gentled the panther for a few minutes, and Bagheera lay down like a cat before a fire, his eyes half shut. They are very long at their talk under the tree, Mowgli said. Buldu must have told many tales. They should come soon to drag the woman and her man out of the trap and put them into the red flower. They will find that trap sprung. <laughs> Let them find me here, said Bagheera. I do not think they will tie me with cords. Mowgli heard the strings of the cot creak under the great brute's weight. By the broken lock that freed me, they will think they've caught big game. <laughs> Come and sit beside me, little brother. We will give them good hunting together. No, I have another thought in my stomach. The man-pack shall not know what share I have in the sport. Make thine own hunt. I do not wish to see them. Be it so, said Bagheera as Mowgli crept out through the window. Oh, now they come. The conference under the peepul tree had been growing noisier and noisier at the far end of the village. It broke in wild yells and a rush up the street of men and women waving clubs and bamboos and sickles. Buldu and the Brahmin were at the head of it, but the mob was close at their heels, and they cried, The witch and the wizard, let us see if hot coins will make them confess. Burn the hut over their heads. We will teach them to shelter wolf devils. The catch of the door had been very firmly fastened, but the crowd tore it away bodily, and the light of the torches streamed into the room where, stretched at full length on the bed, black as the pit and terrible as a demon, lay Bagheera. There was one half minute of desperate silence as the front ranks of the crowd clawed and tore their way back from the threshold. And in that minute, Bagheera raised his head and yawned, elaborately, as he would yawn when he wished to insult an equal. Next instant, the street was empty. Bagheera had leaped back through the window and stood at Mowgli's side while a yelling, screaming torrent scrambled and tumbled one over another in their panic haste to get to their own huts. They could hear the sound of heavy grain boxes being dragged over earthen floors and set down against doors. <laughs> they will not stir till day comes, said Bagheera quietly. Now, little brother, there is nothing more to do. A man and woman will not be put into the red flower, and all goes well in the jungle. Come hunting with me and Baloo. He has new hives that he wishes to show, and we all desire thee back again, as of old. Let us forget the man-pack. They shall be forgotten in a little while. Where does Hutty, the wild elephant, feed tonight? Where he chooses. Who can answer for the silent one? 
But why? What is there Hutty can do which we cannot? Bid him and his three sons come here to me. <laughs> but indeed, little brother, it is not seemly to say come and go to Hutty. Remember, he is the master of the jungle. And before the man pack changed the look on thy face, he taught thee the master words of the jungle. That is all one. I have a master word for him now. Bid him come to Mowgli the frog, and if he does not hear at first, bid him come because of the sack of the fields of Burtpore. The sack of the fields of Burtpore. Bagheera repeated two or three times to make sure. I go. Hutty can but be angry at the worst, and I would give a moon's hunting to hear a master word that compels the silent one. It was a master word. Bagheera was whispering in his ear. They were feeding by the river, and they obeyed as though they were bullocks. Look where they come now. Hattie and his three sons had arrived, in their usual way, without a sound. The mud of the river was still fresh on their flanks, and Hutty was thoughtfully chewing the green stem of a young plantain tree that he'd gouged up with his tusks. When Mowgli spoke, it was to Bagheera, and not to the elephants that he addressed his remarks. I will tell a tale that was told to me by the hunter ye hunted today, said Mowgli. It concerns an elephant, old and wise, who fell into a trap, and the sharpened stake in the pit scarred him from a little above his head to the crest of his shoulder, leaving a white mark. Mowgli threw out his hand, and as Hutty wheeled in the moonlight, a long white scar on his slaty side showed up clearly. Men came to take him from the trap, Mowgli continued, but he broke his ropes, for he was strong, and went away till his wound was healed. Then came he, angry, by night, to the fields of those hunters. And I remember now that he had three sons. These things happened many, many rains ago, and very far away, among the fields of Burtpore. What came to those fields at the next reaping, Hattie? They were reaped by me and my three sons, said Hattie. And to the ploughing that follows the reaping, said Mowgli. There was no ploughing, said Hattie. And to the men that lived by the green crops on the ground, said Mowgli. They went away. And to the huts in which the men slept, we tore the roofs to pieces, and the jungle swallowed up the walls, said Hattie. That was the sack of the fields of Burtpore, which I and my three sons did. It was well done, Hattie, with the white mark, but the second time it shall be done better, for the reason that there is a man to direct. Thou knowest the village of the man-pack that cast me out. They are idle, senseless, and cruel. When they are full-fed, they would throw their own bread into the red flower. This I have seen. It is not well that they should live here any more. Let them run as the men ran from the fields of Bultpore, till we have the rainwater for the only plough, and the noise of the rain on the thick leaves for the pattering of their spindles, till Bagheera and I lair in the house of the Brahmin and the buck drink at the tank behind the temple. Drive in your peoples. Let the deer and the pig and the nilgai look to it. Let in the jungle, Hattie. Thy war shall be our war, said Hattie. We will let in the jungle. Hattie and his three sons turned, each to one point of the compass, and went striding silently down the valleys. They went on and on, for two days' march, that is to say, a long sixty miles, through the jungle, and every step they took 
and every wave of their trunks was known and noted and talked over by Mang and Cheel and the monkey people and all the birds. Then they began to feed and fed quietly for a week or so. Hattie and his sons are like Carr the rock python. They never hurry till they have to. At the end of that time, a rumour went through the jungle that there was better food and water to be found in such and such a valley. The pig, who of course will go to the ends of the earth for a full meal, moved first by companies, scuffling over the rocks, and the deer followed, with the small wild foxes that live on the dead and dying of the herds, and the heavy-shouldered nilgai moved parallel with the deer, and the wild buffaloes of the swamps came after the nilgai. At the end of another ten days or so, the situation was this. The deer and the pig and the nilgai were milling round and round in a circle of eight or ten miles radius, while the eaters of flesh skirmished round its edge. And the centre of that circle was the village, and round the village the crops were ripening. And in the crops sat men on what they called machans, platforms like pigeon perches made of sticks at the top of four poles to scare away birds and other stealers. It was a dark night when Hattie and his three sons slipped down from the jungle and broke off the poles of the machans with their trunks. They fell as a snapped stalk of hemlock in bloom falls, and the men that tumbled from them heard the deep gurgling of the elephants in their ears. Then the vanguard of the armies of the deer broke down and flooded into the village grazing grounds and the ploughed fields, and the sharp-hoofed, rooting wild pig came with them, and what the deer left the pig spoiled, and from time to time an alarm of wolves would shake the herds, and they would rush to and fro desperately, treading down the young barley and cutting flat the banks of the irrigating canals. Before the dawn broke, the work was practically done. When the villagers looked in the morning, they saw their crops were lost, and that meant death if they did not get away, for they lived year in and year out as near to starvation as the jungle was near to them. When the buffaloes were sent to graze, the hungry brutes found that the deer had cleared the grazing grounds, and so wandered into the jungle and drifted off with their wild mates. And when twilight fell, the three or four ponies that belonged to the village lay in their stables with their heads beaten in. Only Bagheera could have given those blows. The villagers stayed on as long as any summer food was left to them, and they tried to gather nuts in the jungle, but shadows with glaring eyes watched them. And when they ran back afraid to their walls, on the tree trunks they had passed not five minutes before, the bark would be stripped and chilled with the stroke of some great taloned paw. The more they kept to their village, the bolder grew the wild things that gambled and bellowed in the grazing grounds by the Wangunga. They had no time to patch and plaster the rear walls of the empty byres that backed onto the jungle. The wild pig trampled them down, and the knotty-rooted vines hurried after and threw their elbows over the new one ground. The unmarried men ran away first, and carried the news far and near that the village was doomed. Who could fight, they said, against the jungle? At last, the nightly trumpetings of Hattie and his three sons ceased to trouble them, for they had no more to be robbed of. The crop on the ground and the seed in the ground had been taken. The outlying fields were already losing their shape, and it was time to throw themselves on the charity of the English at Kaniwara. Native fashion, they delayed their departure from one day to another till the first rains caught them, and the unmended roofs let in a flood, and the grazing ground stood ankle-deep, and all life came on with a rush after the heat of the summer. Then they waded out, men, women, and children, through the blinding hot rain of the morning. A month later, the place was a dimpled mound, covered with soft green young stuff, and by the end of the rains, there was the roaring jungle in full blast on the spot that had been under the plough not six months before. The King's Ankus One afternoon, Mowgli was sitting in the circle of Carr's great coils. Carr had very courteously packed himself under Mowgli's broad bare shoulders so that the boy was really resting in a living armchair. Three or four moons since, said Carr. 
I hunted in cold lairs, which place thou hast not forgotten. And the thing I hunted ran into a burrow that led very far. I followed, and having killed, I slept. When I waked, I went forward, coming at last upon a white cobra, who spoke of things beyond my knowledge, and who showed me many things I had never seen before. New game? Was it good hunting? said Mowgli eagerly. It was no game, and would have broken all my teeth. But the white hood said that a man, he spoke as one that knew the breed, would give the breath under his ribs for only the sight of those things. We two spoke together under the earth, and I spoke of thee, naming thee as a man. Said the white hood, and he is indeed as old as the jungle. It is long since I have seen a man. Let him come, and he shall see all these things, for the least of which very many men would die. That must be new game, said Mowgli. And yet the poison people do not tell us when game is afoot. They're an unfriendly folk. It is not game. I cannot say what it is. We will go there. I've never seen a white hood, and I wish to see the other things. Did he kill them? They are all dead things. He says he is the keeper of them all. Oh, as a wolf stands above meat, he has taken to his own lair. Let's go. The two set off for cold lairs, the deserted city of which you may have heard. The monkey people were raiding in the jungle, and so cold lairs lay empty and silent in the moonlight. Carr led up to the ruins of the Queen's pavilion that stood on the terrace, slipped over the rubbish, and dived down the half-choked staircase that went underground from the centre of the pavilion. Mowgli followed on his hands and knees. They crawled a long distance down a sloping passage that turned and twisted several times, and at last came to where the roots of some great tree, growing thirty feet overhead, had forced out a solid stone in the wall. They crept through the gap and found themselves in a large vault whose domed roof had been also broken away by tree roots so that a few streaks of light dropped down into the darkness. A safe lair, said Mowgli, rising to his feet, but over far to visit daily. But what is there to see? Am I nothing? said a voice in the middle of the vault and Mowgli saw something white move, till, little by little, there stood up the hugest cobra he had ever set eyes on, a creature nearly eight feet long, and bleached, by being in darkness, to an old ivory white. His eyes were as red as rubies, and altogether he was most wonderful. Good hunting, said Mowgli. What of the city? said the white cobra, without answering the greeting. What of the great walled city? The city of a hundred elephants, and twenty thousand horses, and cattle past counting. The city of the king of twenty kings. I grow deaf here, and it is long since I heard their war gongs. The jungle is above our heads, said Mowgli. I know only Hutty and his sons among elephants. Bagheera has slain all the horses in one village. And what is a king? I told thee four moons ago, said Carr softly to the cobra, that thy city is no longer. The great city of the forest can never pass. They builded it before my father's father came from the egg, and it shall endure when my son's sons are as white as I. Father of cobras, said Carr, there is only the jungle here. Then who is he? said the white cobra, sitting down before me, unafraid, not knowing the name of the king, talking our talk through a man's lips. Mowgli, they call me, 
was the answer. I am of the jungle. The wolves are my people, and Car here is my brother, father of cobras. Who art thou? I am the warden of the king's treasure. Kurun Raja builded the stone above me in the days when my skin was dark, that I might teach death to those who came to steal. Then they let down the treasure through the stone, and I heard the song of the Brahmins, my masters. Five times since I came here has the stone been lifted, but always to let down more and never to take away. There are no riches like these riches, the treasures of a hundred kings. Thrice have men found their way here, but they never spoke till I came upon them groping in the dark, and then they cried only a little time. The city is dead, ye say. Stoop down then and take what ye will. Earth has no treasure like to these. Father of Cobra, said Mowgli, I see nothing here to take away. By the gods of the sun and moon, it is the madness of death upon the boy, hissed the Cobra. Look thou, and see what man has never seen before. Mowgli stared with puckered up eyes round the vault, and then lifted up from the floor a handful of something that glittered. Oh ho, said he. This is like the stuff they play with in the man-pack, only this is yellow and the other was brown. He let the gold pieces fall and moved forward. The floor of the vault was buried some five or six feet deep in coined gold and silver that had burst from the sacks it had been originally stored in, and in the long years the metal had packed and settled as sand packs at low tide. On it and in it and rising through it, as wrecks lift through the sand, were jewelled elephant howdars of embossed silver, studded with plates of hammered gold. There were litters for carrying queens, framed and braced with silver and enamel. There were golden candlesticks, hung with pierced emeralds. There were studded images, five feet high of forgotten gods, silver with jewelled eyes. There were coats of mail, gold inlaid on steel, helmets, crested and beaded with pigeon's blood rubies, golden sacrificial bowls and ladles, incense burners, combs, and pots for perfume. There were armlets, finger rings, belts, and wooden boxes, trebly clamped with iron, from which the wood had fallen away in powder, showing piles of uncut sapphires, opals, rubies, diamonds, and emeralds. The white cobra was right. No mere money would begin to pay the value of this treasure the sifted pickings of centuries of war, plunder, trade and taxation. But Mowgli naturally did not understand what these things meant. The knives interested him a little, but they did not balance so well as his own, and so he dropped them. At last, he found something really fascinating, laid on the front of a howdah, half buried in the coins. It was a three-foot ankus, or elephant goad, or something like a small boat hook. The top was one round shining ruby, and eight inches of the handle below it were studded with rough turquoises close together, giving a most satisfactory grip. Below them was a rim of jade with a flower pattern running round it. Only the leaves were emeralds, and the blossoms were rubies sunk in the cool green stone. The rest of the handle was a shaft of pure ivory, while the point, the spike and hook, was gold inlaid steel. I do not understand, said Mowgli. The things are hard and cold and by no means good to eat. But this, he lifted the ankus, I desire to take away that I may see it in the sun. Thou sayest they are all thine? Wilt thou give it to me, and I will bring thee frogs to eat? The white cobra fairly shook with evil delight. Assuredly I will give it, he said. All that is here I will give thee, till thou goest away. Carr flung himself forward with blazing eyes. Who bade me bring the man? he hissed. There was no talk of killing. How can I go to the jungle and say that I have led him to his death? Never man.
man came here that went away with the breath under his ribs, cried the cobra. I am the warden of the treasure of the king's city. Wait a while, car of the rocks, and see the boy run. There is room for great sport here. Life is good. Run to and fro a while and make sport, boy. Mowgli put his hand on Car's head gently. The white thing has dealt with men of the man-pack until now. He does not know me, he whispered. He has asked for this hunting. Let him have it. Mowgli had been standing with the ankus held point down. He flung it crossways just behind the great snake's hood, pinning him to the floor. In a flash, Carr's weight was upon the writhing body, paralyzing it from hood to tail. The red eyes burned, and the six spare inches of the head struck furiously right and left. Kill, said Carr, as Mowgli's hand went to his knife. No, he said as he drew the blade. I will never kill again save for food. But look you, Carr. He caught the snake behind the hood, forcing the mouth open with the blade of the knife, and showed the terrible poison fangs of the upper jaw lying black and withered in the gum. The white cobra had outlived his poison, as a snake will. It is dried up, said Mowgli, and motioning Carr away, he picked up the ankus, setting the white cobra free. The king's treasure needs a new warden he said gravely. I am ashamed. Kill me, hissed the white cobra. There has been too much talk of killing. We will go now. I take the thorn-pointed thing because I have fought and worsted thee. See then that the thing does not kill thee at last. It is death. Remember, it is death. There is enough in that thing to kill the men of all my city. Not long wilt thou hold it, jungle man, nor he who takes it from thee. They will kill and kill and kill for its sake. My strength is dried up, but the Ankus will do my work. It is death. Mowgli crawled out through the hole into the passage again, and the last that he saw was the white cobra striking furiously with its harmless fangs at the stolid golden faces of the gods that lay on the floor. They were glad to get to the light of day once more, and when they were back in their own jungle and Mowgli made the ankles glitter in the morning light, he was almost as pleased as though he had found a bunch of new flowers to stick in his hair. Oh, this is brighter than Bagheera's eyes, he said delightedly as he twirled the ruby. I will show it to him. Good hunting. He danced off, flourishing the great hankers and stopping from time to time to admire it, till he came to that part of the jungle Bagheera chiefly used, and found him drinking after a heavy kill. Mowgli told him all his adventures from beginning to end, and Bagheera sniffed at the ankus between whiles. When Mowgli came to the white cobra's last words, the panther purred approvingly. I was born in the king's cages at Udipore and it is in my stomach that I know some little of man. Very many men would kill thrice in a night for the sake of that one big red stone alone. But for what use was this thorn-pointed thing made? asked Mowgli. It was made by men to thrust into the head of the sons of Hutti, so that the blood should pour out. I have seen the like in the streets of Uripore before our cages. That thing has tasted the blood of many such as Hutti. Always more blood when I come near, even to the things the man-pack have made, said Mowgli disgustedly. If I had known this, I would not have taken it. First it was Meswa's blood on the thongs, and now it's Hutties. I will use it no more. Look! The ankus flew sparkling, and buried itself point down thirty yards away between the trees. So my hands are clean of death, said Mowgli, rubbing his palms on the fresh, moist earth. Death or life, I'm going to sleep. Hmm. I too, little brother, said Bagheera. I cannot hunt all night and howl all day. Bagheera went off to a hunting lair that he knew, about two miles off. Mowgli made an easy way for himself up a convenient tree, knotted three or four creepers together, and in less time than it takes to tell, was swinging in a hammock fifty feet above the ground. When he waked, it was twilight once more. 
I will look at the thing once more, he said, and slid down a creeper to the earth. But Bagheera was before him. Mowgli could hear him snuffing in the half-light. Where is the thorn-pointed thing? cried Mowgli. A man has taken it. Here is the trail. Now we shall see whether the white cobra spoke truth. If the pointed thing is death, that man will die. Let us follow. They buckled down to the trail, and after a while, Mowgli asked, Think you the pointed thing will turn in the man's hand and kill him? We shall see when we find, said Bagheera, trotting with his head low. Now he runs swiftly, said Mowgli. The toes are spread apart. They went over some wet ground. Now why does he turn aside here? Wait, said Bagheera, and flung himself forward with one superb bound as far as ever he could. Here comes another trail to meet him. It is a smaller foot, the second trail, and the toes turn inward. Mowgli ran up and looked. It is the foot of a hunter, he said. Look, here he dragged his bow on the grass. That is why the first trail turned aside so quickly. Big foot hid from little foot. They raced on another half mile, always keeping about the same distance, till Mowgli, whose head was not so close to the ground as Bagheera's, cried, They have met. Look, here stood Littlefoot with his knee on a rock, and yonder is Bigfoot indeed. Not ten yards in front of them, stretched across a pile of broken rocks, lay the body of a villager of the district, a long, small feathered arrow through his back and breast. Was the white cobra so old and so mad, little brother? said Bagheera gently. Here is one death, at least. Follow on. But where is the drinker of elephant's blood, the red-eyed thorn? Littlefoot has it, perhaps. The single trail of a light man who'd been running quickly and bearing a burden on his left shoulder held on round a long, low spur of dried grass where each footfall seemed, to the sharp eyes of the trackers, marked in hot iron. Neither spoke till the trail ran up to the ashes of a campfire hidden in a ravine. Again, said Bagheera, checking as though he'd been turned into stone. The body of the little wizened hunter lay with its feet in the ashes, and Bagheera looked inquiringly at Mowgli. That was done with a bamboo, said the boy, after one glance. One, two, three, four tracks, four tracks of men with shod feet. Now, what evil had the little woodman done to them? See, they talked together, all five, standing up before they killed him. No more was said for fully an hour, as they worked up the broad trail of the four men with shod feet. It was clear hot daylight now, and Bagheera said, I smell smoke. Men are always more ready to eat than to run, Mowgli answered, trotting in and out between the low scrub bushes of the new jungle they were exploring. Bagheera, a little to his left, made an indescribable noise in his throat. Here is one that has done with feeding, said he. A tumbled bundle of grey-coloured clothes lay under a bush, and round it was some spilt flour. That was done by the bamboo again, said Mowgli. See, that white dust is what men eat. They have taken the kill from this one. He carried their food and given him for a kill to cheal the kite. It is the third said Bagheera. They had not gone half a mile farther when they heard Ko the Crow singing the death song in the top of a tamarisk under whose shade three men were lying. A half-dead fire smoked in the centre of the circle under an iron plate which held a blackened and burned cake of unleavened bread. Close to the fire and blazing in the sunshine lay the ruby and turquoise ankus. The thing works quickly, all ends here, said Bagheera. How did these die, Mowgli? There is no mark on any. Mowgli sniffed the smoke that came up from the fire, 
broke off a morsel of the blackened bread, tasted it, and spat it out again. Apple of death, he coughed. The first must have made it ready in the food for these who killed him, having first killed the hunter. Apple of death is what the jungle call thorn apple, or datura, the readiest poison in all India. What now? said the panther. Must thou and I kill each other for yonder red-eyed slayer? Between us two it can do no wrong, for we do not desire what men desire. If it be left here, it will assuredly continue to kill men one after another, as fast as nuts fall in a high wind. I have no love for men, but even I would not have them die six in a night. This, he handled the ankles gingerly, goes back to the father of cobras. Two nights later, as the white cobra sat mourning in the darkness of the vault, ashamed and robbed and alone, the turquoise ankust whirled through the hole in the wall and clashed on the floor of golden coins. Father of cobras, said Mowgli, get thee a young and ripe one of thine own people to help thee guard the king's treasure, so that no man may come away alive any more. Ah, it returns then. I said the thing was death. How comes it that thou art still alive? The old cobra mumbled, twining lovingly round the ankus. By the bull that bought me, I do not know. That thing has killed six times in a night. Let him go out no more. Red Dog In the course of time, father and mother wolf died, and Mowgli rolled a big boulder against the mouth of their cave and cried the death song over them. Baloo grew very old and stiff, and even Bagheera was a shade slower on the kill than he had been. Akela turned from grey to milky white with pure age, his ribs stuck out, and he walked as though he had been made of wood, and Mowgli killed for him. But the young wolves, the children of the disbanded Sioni pack, throve and increased, and when there were about forty of them, Akela told them that they ought to gather themselves together and follow the law, and run under one head, as befitted the free people. This was not a question in which Mowgli concerned himself, but when Feo, son of Fiona, his father was the great tracker in the days of Akela's headship, fought his way to the leadership of the pack according to the jungle law, and the old calls and songs began to ring under the stars once more, Mowgli came to the council rock for memory's sake. When he chose to speak, the pack waited till he had finished, and he sat at Akela's side on the rock above Feo. One twilight, when he was trotting leisurely across the ranges to give Akela the half of a buck that he'd killed, while the four jogged behind him, Mowgli heard a cry that had never been heard since the bad days of Shere Khan. It was what they call in the jungle the fial. It was a hideous kind of shriek that the jackal gives when he is hunting behind a tiger or when there is a big killing afoot. The four stopped at once, bristling and growling. Mowgli's hand went to his knife, and he checked, his eyebrows knotted. The cry broke out again, half sobbing and half chuckling, just as though the jackal had soft human lips. Then Mowgli drew deep breath and ran to the council rock, overtaking on his way hurrying wolves of the pack. Feo and Akela were on the rock together, and below them, every nerve strained, sat the others. The mothers and the cubs were cantering off to their lairs, for when the fial cries, it is no time for weak things to be abroad. They could hear nothing, except the Weingunga rushing and gurgling in the dark, and the light evening winds among the treetops, till suddenly, across the river, a wolf called. It was no wolf of the pack, for they were all up the rock. The note changed to a long, despairing bay. Dole, it said. Dole, dole, dole. They heard tired feet on the rocks, and a gaunt wolf 
streaked with red on his flanks, his right forepaw useless, and his jaws white with foam, flung himself into the circle and lay gasping at Mowgli's feet. Good hunting. Under whose headship? said Feo gravely. Good hunting. Woon taller am I, was the answer. He meant that he was a solitary wolf fending for himself, as do many wolves in the south. Woon taller means an outlier, one who lies out from any pack. Then he panted, and they could see his heartbeats shake him backward and forward. What moves? said Feo, for that is the question all the jungle asks after the fial cries. The dole of the Deccan. Red Dog, the killer. They came from the south, saying the Deccan was empty and killing out by the way. When this moon was new, there were four to me, my mate and three cubs. At the dawn wind, I found them stiff in the grass. Then sought I my blood right and found the dole. How many? said Mowgli quickly. I do not know. Three of them will kill no more. But at last they drove me like the buck. On my three legs they drove me. He thrust out his mangled forefoot, all dark with dried blood. There were cruel bites low down on his side, and his throat was torn and worried. Eat, said Akela, rising up from the meat Mowgli had brought him, and the outlier flung himself upon it. What Woon Toller had said meant that the dole, the red hunting dog of the Deccan, was moving to kill, and the pack knew well that even the tiger will surrender a new kill to the dole. They drive straight through the jungle, and what they meet they pull down and tear to pieces, though they're not as big nor half as cunning as the wolf, they are very strong and very numerous. The dole do not begin to call themselves a pack till they are a hundred strong, whereas forty wolves make a very fair pack indeed. Akela knew something of the doles too, for he said to Mowgli quietly, It is better to die in a full pack than leaderless and alone. This is good hunting. And my last. But, as men live, thou hast very many more nights and days, little brother. Go north and lie down, and if any live after the dole has gone by, he shall bring thee word of the fight. Ah, oh, said Mowgli gravely, must I go to the marshes and catch little fish and sleep in a tree, or must I ask help of the monkey people and crack nuts while the pack fight below? It is to the death, said Akela. Thou hast never met the dole, the red killer. <laughs> Even the striped one. Listen now, said Mowgli. When the dole come, Mowgli and the free people are of one skin for that hunting. This my knife shall be as a tooth to the pack, and I do not think it is so blunt. This is my word. The pack answered with one deep, crashing bark that sounded in the night like a big tree falling. Feo and Akela must make ready for the battle. I go to count the dogs. He hurried off into the darkness, wild with excitement, hardly looking where he set foot, and the natural consequence was that he tripped full length over Carr's great coils, where the python lay watching a deer path near the river. <laughs> said Carr angrily. Is this jungle work, to stamp and tramp and undo a night's hunting when the game are moving so well too? Oh, the fault was mine, said Mowgli, picking himself up. Indeed, I was seeking thee, Flathead, but each time we meet, thou art longer and broader by the length of my arm. There is none like thee in the jungle, wise, old, strong, and most beautiful Carr. Hmm. Now whither does this trail lead? Carr's voice was gentler. Not a moon since. There was a manling with a knife, threw stones at my head and called me bad little tree-cat names because I lay asleep in the open. Mowgli told him all that had happened in the jungle that night. 
Wise I may be, said Carl at the end, but deaf I surely am. Else I should have heard the fial. How many be the dole? I have not yet seen. I came hot foot to thee. Oh, Carl, it will be good hunting. Few of us will see another moon. Dost thou strike in this? Remember, thou art a man, and remember what pack cast thee out. Let the wolf look to the dog. Thou art a man. It is true that I am a man, said Mowgli, but this night I have said that I am a wolf. I am of the free people, Carr. Till the dole have gone by, my word comes not back to me. But what is in thy stomach to do when the dole come? They must swim the Wangunga. I thought to meet them with my knife in the shallows, the pack behind me, and so stabbing and thrusting, we a little might turn them downstream. The dole do not turn, said Carr. There will be neither manling nor wolf cub when that hunting is done, but only dry bones. Hast thou a better plan, Carr? We will go to the river, said Carr, and I will show thee what is to be done against the dole. He turned, straight as an arrow, for the main stream of the Wangunga, plunging in a little above the pool that hid the peace rock, Mowgli at his side. Nay, do not swim, I go swiftly. My back, little brother. Mowgli tucked his left arm round Carr's neck, dropped his right close to his body, and straightened his feet. Then Carr breasted the current as he alone could, and the ripple of the checked water stood up in a frill round Mowgli's neck, and he waved his feet to and fro in the eddy under the python's lashing sides. A mile or two above the peace rock, the Weingunga narrows between a gorge of marble rocks from eighty to a hundred feet high, and the current runs like a mill race between and over all manner of ugly stones. Mowgli was looking at the gorge on either side and sniffing uneasily, for there was a sweetish, sourish smell in the air, very like the smell of a big anthill on a hot day. Instinctively, he lowered himself in the water only raising his head to breathe from time to time, and Carr came to anchor with a double twist of his tail round a sunken rock, holding Mowgli in the hollow of a coil while the water raced on. This is the place of death, said the boy. Why do we come here? Who is the master of the jungle here? whispered Carr. The little people of the rocks, Mowgli answered. It is the place of death, Carr. The split and weather-worn rocks of the gorge of the Wangunga had been used since the beginning of the jungle by the little people of the rocks, the busy, furious, black wild bees of India, and, as Mowgli knew well, all trails turned off half a mile before they reached the gorge. For centuries, the little people had hived and swarmed from cleft to cleft, and swarmed again, staining the white marble with stale honey, and made their combs tall and deep in the dark of the inner caves, where neither man nor beast nor fire nor water had ever touched them. The length of the gorge on both sides was hung as it were with black shimmery velvet curtains, clotted millions of the sleeping bees. The mere Sharp smell of them was enough to frighten anyone who knew what the little people were. Now I will tell thee, said Carr. A hunted buck from the south many rains ago came hither, not knowing the jungle, a pack on his trail. Being made blind with fear, he leaped from above, the pack running by sight, for they were hot and blind on the trail. The sun was high, and the little people were many and very angry. Many, too, were those of the pack who leaped into the Wangunga, but they were dead ere they took water. Those who did not leap died also in the rocks above, but the buck lived because he came first, running for his life, leaping ere the little people were aware, and was in the river when they gathered to kill. The pack, following, was altogether lost, under the weight of the little people. Look now. If the dole follow thee, hot and blind, looking only at thy shoulders, those who do not die up above will take water either here or lower down, 
for the little people will rise up and cover them. Now the Weingunger is hungry water, and they will go down such as live to the shallows by the Sioni lairs, and there thy pack may meet them by the throat. Aye, said Mowgli. Better could not be till the rains fall in the dry season. There is now only the little matter of the run and the leap. I will make me known to the doles, so that they shall follow me very closely. Thou wilt stay here, Carr, till I come again with my doles? Aye, and for thy sake only I will carry word to the pack, that they may know where to look for the dole. But what if they kill thee in the jungle, or the little people kill thee before thou canst leap down to the river? When tomorrow comes we will kill for tomorrow said Mowgli, quoting a jungle saying. He loosed his arm from the python's neck and went down the gorge like a log in a freshet, paddling toward the far bank where he found slack water and laughing aloud from sheer happiness. He had often, with Baloo's help, robbed bees' nests in single trees and he knew that the little people hated the smell of wild garlic. So he gathered a small bundle of it, tied it up with a bark string, and then followed Woontoller's blood trail as it ran southerly from the lairs for some five miles, looking at the trees with his head on one side and chuckling as he looked. Woontoller's trail, all rank with dark blood spots, ran under a forest of thick trees that grew close together and stretched away northeastward, gradually growing thinner and thinner to within two miles of the bee rocks. From the last tree to the low scrub of the bee rocks was open country. Mowgli trotted along under the trees, judging distances between branch and branch, occasionally climbing up a trunk and taking a trial leap from one tree to another, till he came to the open ground, which he studied very carefully. Then he turned, picked up Woontoller's trail where he left it, settled himself in a tree with an outrunning branch some eight feet from the ground, and sat still, sharpening his knife on the sole of his foot, and singing to himself. A little before midday, when the sun was very warm, he heard the patter of feet, and smelt the abominable smell of the dole pack, as they trotted pitilessly along Woontoller's trail. He watched the sharp bay head of the leader snuffling along the trail and gave him good hunting. The brute looked up and his companions halted behind him. Scores and scores of red dogs with low hung tails, heavy shoulders, weak quarters and bloody mouths. Fully two hundred must have gathered below him but he could see that the leader sniffed hungrily on Woontoller's trail and tried to drag the pack forward. But that would never do, or they would be at the lairs in broad daylight, and Mowgli meant to hold them under his tree till dusk. By whose leave do we come here? said Mowgli. All jungles are our jungle, was the reply, and the dole that gave it bared his white teeth. Mowgli looked down with a smile and imitated perfectly the sharp chitter-chatter of Chikai, the leaping rat of the deckhan, and meaning the doles to understand that he considered them no better than Chikai. The pack closed up round the tree trunk, and the leader bayed savagely, calling Mowgli a tree ape. This was exactly what Mowgli wanted. He laid himself down along the branch, his cheek to the bark, his right arm free, and there he told the pack what he thought and knew about them, their manners, their customs, their mates, and their puppies. There is no speech in the world so rancorous and so stinging as the language the jungle people use to show scorn and contempt. Slowly and deliberately, Mowgli drove the doles from silence to growls, from growls to yells, and from yells to hoarse, slavery ravings. The big bay leader had leaped many times in the air, but Mowgli dared not risk a false blow. At last, made furious beyond his natural strength, the leader bounded up seven or eight feet clear of the ground. 
Then Mowgli's hand shot out like the head of a tree snake and gripped him by the scruff of his neck, and the branch shook with a jar as his weight fell back, almost wrenching Mowgli to the ground. But he never loosed his grip, and inch by inch he hauled the beast, hanging like a drowned jackal, up on the branch. With his left hand, he reached for his knife and cut off the red bushy tail, flinging the dole back to earth again. That was all he needed. The pack would not go forward on Woontola's trail now till they had killed Mowgli or Mowgli had killed them. He saw them settle down in circles with a quiver of the haunches that meant they were going to stay. And so he climbed to a higher crotch, settled his back comfortably and went to sleep. After three or four hours, he waked and counted the pack. They were all there. Silent, husky and dry, with eyes of steel. The sun was beginning to sink. In half an hour, the little people of the rocks would be ending their labours. I myself will tear out thy stomach, yelled the leader, scratching at the foot of the tree. Go home, red dog, and cry that an ape has done this. You will not go. Come then with me, and I will make you very wise. Mowgli moved monkey fashion into the next tree, and so on into the next, and the next, the pack following with lifted hungry heads. And when he came to the last tree, he took the garlic and rubbed himself all over carefully, and the doles yelled with scorn. Ape with a wolf's tongue, dost thou think to cover thy scent, they cried, we follow to the death. Take thy tail, said Mowgli, flinging it back along the course he had taken. The pack instinctively rushed after it. And follow now, to the death. He had slipped down the tree trunk and headed like the wind for the bee rocks before the dole saw what he would do. They gave one deep howl and settled down to the long lobbing canter that can at the last run down anything that runs. Mowgli knew their pack pace to be much slower than that of the wolves, or he would never have risked a two-mile run in full sight. They were sure that the boy was theirs at last, and he was sure that he held them to play with as he pleased. All his trouble was to keep them sufficiently hot behind him to prevent their turning off too soon. He ran cleanly, evenly and springingly, the tailless leader not five yards behind him, and the pack tailing out perhaps a quarter of a mile, crazy and blind with rage. He reserved his last effort for the rush across the bee rocks. The little people had gone to sleep in the early twilight, but as Mowgli's first footfalls rang on the hollow ground, he heard a sound as though all the earth were humming. Then he ran as he had never run in his life before. He heard a roar like the roar of the sea in a cave, saw with a tail of his eye the air grow dark behind him, saw the current of the Waingunga far below, and a flat, diamond-shaped head in the water, leaped outward with all his strength, the tailless dole snapping at his shoulder in mid-air, and dropped feet first, to the safety of the river, breathless and triumphant. There was not a sting upon him, for the smell of the garlic had checked the little people for just the few seconds that he was among them. When he rose, Carl's coils were steadying him, and things were bounding over the edge of the cliff. Great lumps, it seemed, of clustered bees falling like plummets. But before any lump touched water, the bees flew upward, and the body of a dole whirled downstream. Overhead, they could hear furious short yells that were drowned in a roar like breakers, the roar of the wings of the little people of the rocks. There were doles who had leaped short into the trees on the cliffs, and the bees blotted out their shapes. But the greater number of them, maddened by the stings, had flung themselves into the river, and as Carr said, the Weingunga was hungry water. 
Carr held Mowgli fast till the boy had recovered his breath. We must not stay here, he said. The little people are roused indeed. Come. The rest is with thy brethren below yonder. Good hunting, little brother. And remember, the dole bites low. Nearer and nearer came the bay of the Sioni wolves, and a bend in the river drove the doles forward among the sands and shoals opposite the lairs. The bank was lined with burning eyes, and except for the horrible fial that had never stopped since sundown, there was no sound in the jungle. The entire pack flung themselves at the shore, threshing and squattering through the water till the face of the Wangunga was all white and torn and the great ripples went from side to side like bow waves from a boat. Mowgli followed the rush, stabbing and slicing as the doles huddled together rushed up the river beach in one wave. Then the long fight began, heaving and straining and splitting and scattering and narrowing and broadening along the red wet sands and over and between the tangled tree roots, for even now the doles were two to one. But they met wolves fighting for all that made the pack, and not only the short, high, deep-chested, white-tusked hunters of the pack, but the anxious-eyed lahinis, the she-wolves of the lair, fighting for their litters, with here and there a yearling wolf, his first coat still half woolly, tugging and grappling by their sides. Mowgli's knife came and went without ceasing. A locked and swaying mob moved from right to left and from left to right along the bank. Here would be a heaving mound, which would break like a water blister, and throw up four or five mangled dogs, each striving to get back to the centre. Here would be a single wolf, borne down by two or three doles. Here a yearling cub would be held up by the pressure round him, though he was already dead. Once Mowgli passed a kaler, a dole on either flank, and his all but toothless jaws closed over the loins of a third, and once he saw Feo, his teeth set in the throat of a dole, tugging the unwilling beast forward till the yearlings could finish him. But the bulk of the fight was blind, flurry, and smother in the dark, hit, trip, and tumble, yelp, groan, and worry, 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 round him and behind him and above him. Dole after dole was slinking away now from those dark and bloody sands to the river, to the thick jungle upstream or downstream, as he saw the road clear. From under a mound of nine dead rose a Kayla's head, and Mowgli dropped on his knees beside the lone wolf. <laughs> Said I not it would be my last fight? Akela gasped. It is good hunting. And thou... Little brother, I live, having killed many. Even so, I die now. I would die by thee, little brother. It is long since the old days of Shere Khan, and a man-cub that rolled naked in the dust. Nay, nay, I am a wolf. I am of one skin with the free people. Mowgli cried. It is no will of mine that I am a man. <sighs> Thou art a man, little brother. Thou art a man. Or else the pack had fled before the dole. My life I owe to thee. And today thou hast saved the pack, even as once I saved thee. All debts are paid now. This hunting is ended. Mowgli sat with his head on his knees, careless of anything else, while the remnant of the flying doles were being overtaken and run down by the merciless Lahinis. Little by little, the cries died away, and the wolves returned limping to take stock of the losses. Fifteen of the pack, as well as half a dozen Lahinis, lay dead by the river. Of the others, not one was unmarked. And Mowgli sat through it all, till the cold daybreak, when Feo's wet, red muzzle was dropped in his hand. And Mowgli drew back to show the gaunt body of Akela. Good hunting, said Feo. 
as though Akela were still alive. And then, over his bitten shoulder to the others, Howl, dogs! A wolf has died tonight. But of all the pack of two hundred fighting doles, whose boast was that all jungles were their jungle, and that no living thing could stand before them, not one returned to the Deccan to carry that word. The Spring Running In the second year after the great fight with Red Dog and the death of Akela, Mowgli was seventeen years old. He looked older, for hard exercise and the best of good eating had given him strength and growth far beyond his age. He could swing by one hand from a top branch for half an hour at a time. He could stop a young buck in mid-gallop and throw him sideways by the head. The jungle people who used to fear him for his wits feared him now for his strength, and when he moved quickly on his own affairs, the mere whisper of his coming cleared the wood paths. One day Bagheera and Mowgli were lying out far up the side of a hill overlooking the Wangunga, and the morning mists hung below them in bands of white and green. It was the end of the cold weather, the leaves and the trees looked worn and faded, and there was a dry, ticking rustle everywhere when the wind blew. Bagheera sniffed the morning air with a deep, hollow cough. Mm, the year turns, he said. The jungle goes forward. The time of new talk is near. It is good. I shall know when the time of new talk is here, said Mowgli because then thou and the others all run away and leave me alone. But indeed, little brother, Bagheera began, we do not. I say ye do, said Mowgli angrily. Ye do run away, and I, who am the master of the jungle, must needs walk alone. In an Indian jungle, the seasons slide one into the other almost without division. There is one day when all things are tired and the very smells as they drift on the heavy air are old and used. Then there is another day, to the eye, nothing whatever has changed, when all the smells are new and delightful, and the whiskers of the jungle people quiver to their roots, and the winter hair comes away from their sides in long, draggled locks. Then perhaps a little rain falls, and all the trees and the bushes and the bamboos and the mosses wake with a noise of growing that you can almost hear. And under this noise runs, day and night, a deep hum. That is the noise of the spring, a vibrating boom which is neither bees nor falling water nor the wind in the treetops, but the purring of the warm, happy world. Up to this year, Mowgli had always delighted in the turn of the seasons. Like all his people, spring was the season he chose for his flittings, moving, for the mere joy of rushing through the warm air, thirty, forty or fifty miles between twilight and the morning star and coming back, panting and laughing and wreathed with strange flowers. But this spring, Mowgli's stomach was changed in him. Ever since the bamboo shoots turned spotty brown, he'd been looking forward to the morning when the smells would change. But when the morning came, and more, the peacock, blazing in bronze and blue and gold, cried it aloud all along the misty woods, and Mowgli opened his mouth to send on the cry, the words choked between his teeth, and a feeling came over him that began at his toes and ended in his hair, a feeling of pure unhappiness, so that he looked himself over to be sure that he'd not trod on a thorn. More cried the new smells, the other birds took it over, and from the rocks by the Wangunga he heard Bagheera's hoarse scream, something between the scream of an eagle and the neighing of a horse. There was a yelling and scattering of monkey people in the new budding branches above. And there stood Mowgli, his chest filled to answer more, sinking in little gasps as the breath was driven out of it by this unhappiness. It is time to make a running, he said to himself. Tonight I will cross the ranges. Yes, I will make a spring running to the marshes of the north and back again. 
I have hunted too easily too long. The four shall come with me, for they grow as fat as white grubs. He called, but never one of the four answered. They were far beyond earshot, singing over the spring songs with the other wolves of the pack. Mowgli gave the sharp barking note, but his only answer was the mocking meow of the little spotted tree cat winding in and out among the branches for early birds' nests. At this, he shook all over with rage, and then he became very haughty, though there was no one to see him, and stalked severely down the hillside, chin up and eyebrows down. That night, he set off on his spring running. The moon splashed her light full on rock and pool, slipped it between trunk and creeper, and sifted it through a million leaves. Forgetting his unhappiness, Mowgli sang aloud with pure delight as he settled into his stride. It was more like flying than anything else, for he had chosen the long downward slope that leads to the northern marshes through the heart of the main jungle. When he tired of ground-going, he threw up his hands monkey-fashion to the nearest creeper and seemed to float rather than to climb up into the thin branches, whence he would follow a tree road till his mood changed, and he shot downward in a long leafy curve to the levels again. So he ran, sometimes shouting, sometimes singing to himself, the happiest thing in all the jungle that night. He came at last to the great marsh that was his farthest hunting ground, and crossed it swiftly and surely. The marsh ended in a broad plain where a light twinkled. It was a long time since Mowgli had concerned himself with the doings of men, but this night the glimmer of the red flower drew him forward. He trod through the dew-loaded grasses till he came to the hut where the light stood. Three or four yelping dogs gave tongue, for he was on the outskirts of a village. The door of the hut opened, and a woman stood peering into the darkness. A child cried, and the woman said over her shoulder, Sleep. It was but a jackal that waked the dogs. In a little time the morning comes. Mowgli in the grass began to shake as though he had a fever. He knew that voice well, but to make sure he cried softly surprised to find how man's talk came back. Meswa! Oh, Meswa! Who calls? said the woman, a quiver in her voice. Hast thou forgotten? said Mowgli. His throat was dry as he spoke. If it be thou, what name did I give thee? said the woman. Natu, said Mowgli, for as you remember, that was the name Meshwa gave him when he first came to the man-pack. Come, my son, she called, and Mowgli stepped into the light and looked full at Meshwa, the woman who'd been good to him and whose life he had saved from the man-pack so long before. She was older and her hair was grey, but her eyes and her voice had not changed. My son, she stammered, and then sinking to his feet. But it is no longer, my son. It is a godling of the woods. As he stood in the red light of the oil lamp, strong, tall, and beautiful, his long black hair sweeping over his shoulders, the knife swinging at his neck, and his head crowned with a wreath of white jasmine, he might easily have been mistaken for some wild god of a jungle legend. The child, half asleep on a cot, sprang up and shrieked aloud with terror. Meswa turned to soothe him, while Mowgli stood still. What wilt thou eat and drink? Meswa murmured. This is all thine. We owe our lives to thee. Where is he? The man that dug in the dirt when he was afraid on that night. He is dead. A year ago. And he? Mowgli pointed to the child. My son, that was born two rains ago. And if thou art Natu, whom the tiger carried away, Meswa went on, he is then thy younger brother. Give him an elder brother's blessing. 
What do I know of the thing called a blessing? I am neither a godling nor his brother. And, oh, mother, my heart is heavy in me. Mowgli shivered as he set down the child. Like enough, said Meswa, bustling among the cooking pots. This comes of running about the marshes by night. Beyond question, the fever has soaked thee to the marrow. Mowgli smiled a little at the idea of anything in the jungle hurting him. I will make a fire, and thou shalt drink warm milk. Mowgli sat down muttering, with his face in his hands. All manner of strange feelings that he'd never felt before were running over him, exactly as though he'd been poisoned, and he felt dizzy and a little sick. He drank the warm milk in long gulps, Meswa patting him on the shoulder from time to time. He wanted to finish his spring running, but the child insisted on sitting in his arms, and Meswa would have it that his long blue-black hair must be combed out. So she sang as she combed, foolish little baby songs, now calling Mowgli her son, and now begging him to give some of his jungle power to the child. The hut door was closed, but Mowgli heard a sound he knew well, and saw Meswal's jaw drop with horror, as a great grey paw came under the bottom of the door, and grey brother outside whined a muffled and penitent whine of anxiety and fear. Out and wait! Ye would not come when I called, said Mowgli in jungle talk without turning his head, and the great grey paw disappeared. Oh, do not bring thy servants with thee, said Meswa. We have always lived at peace with the jungle. It is peace, said Mowgli, rising. Think of that night on the road to Kaniwara. There were scores of such folk before thee and behind thee. But I see that even in springtime, the jungle people do not always forget. Mother, I go. Meswa drew aside humbly, but as his hand was on the door, the mother in her made her throw her arms round Mowgli's neck again and again. Oh, come back, she whispered. Son or no son, come back, for I love thee. By night or by day, this door is never shut to thee. Mowgli's throat worked as though the cords in it were being pulled, and his voice seemed to be dragged from it as he answered, I will surely come back. And now, he said, as he put by the head of the fawning wolf on the threshold, I have a little cry against thee, grey brother. Why came ye not all four when I called? I, we were singing in the jungle the new songs, for this is the time of new talk. But as soon as the songs were sung, I followed thy trail. Why, I ran from all the others and followed hot foot. We follow thee always, except in the time of new talk. Have I not followed thee tonight? Aye, but would thou follow me again and again, Grey Brother? Grey Brother was silent. When he spoke, he growled to himself, The Black One spoke truth. And he said, Man goes to man at the last. Raksha, our mother, said, So also said Akela on the night of the Red Dog, Mowgli muttered. Or so also says Ka, who is wiser than us all. What dost thou say? Grey brother? Well, they cast thee out once with bad talk. They cut thy mouth with stones. They sent Buldu to slay thee. They would have thrown thee into the red flower. Thou and not I hast said that they are evil and senseless. Thou and not I didst let in the jungle upon them. Thou and not I didst make song against them, more bitter even than our song against Red Dog. I ask thee what thou sayest. They were talking as they ran. Grey Brother cantered on a while without replying, and then he said, Man-cub, master of the jungle, son of Raksha, lair brother to me, thy trail is my trail, thy lair is my lair, thy kill is my kill, and thy death fight is my death fight. I speak for the three, but what wilt thou say to the jungle? That is well thought. Go before and cry them all to the council rock, and I will tell them 
what is in my stomach. At any other season, the news would have called all the jungle together with bristling necks, but now they were busy hunting and fighting and killing and singing. So when Mowgli, heavy-hearted, came up through the well-remembered rocks to the place where he'd been brought into the council, he found only the four, Baloo, who was nearly blind with age, and the heavy, cold-blooded car coiled round Akela's empty seat. Thy trail ends here, then, manling, said Carr, as Mowgli threw himself down, his face in his hands. Cry thy cry. We be of one blood, thou and I, man and snake together. My strength is gone from me, the boy moaned. It is not any poison. I lie down, but I do not rest. I run the spring running, but I am not made still. A red flower is in my body, my bones are water, and I know not what I know. Oh, what need of talk, said Baloo slowly, turning his head to where Mowgli lay. I said it, but Mowgli should drive Mowgli back to the man-pack. But who listens now to Baloo? Bagheera. Where is Bagheera this night? He knows also. It is the law. When we met at Cold Lairs, Manling, I knew it, said Carr. Man goes to man at the last, though the jungle does not cast him out. The jungle does not cast me out, then, Mowgli stammered. Little frog, take thine own trail. Make thy lair with thine own blood and pack and people. But when there is need of foot or tooth or eye or a word carried swiftly by night, remember, master of the jungle, the jungle is thine at call. My brothers, cried Mowgli, throwing up his arms with a sob. I know not what I know. I would not go, but I am drawn by both feet. How shall I leave these nights? Nay, look up, little brother, Baloo repeated. There is no shame in this hunting. When the honey is eaten, we leave the empty hive. Having cast the skin, said Carr, we may not creep into it afresh. It is the law. Listen, dearest of all to me, said Baloo, there is neither word nor will here to hold thee back. Look up. Who may question the master of the jungle? I saw thee playing among the white pebbles yonder, when thou wast a little frog, and Bagheera, that bought thee for the price of a young bull newly killed, saw thee also. Of that looking over, we two only remain, for Raksha, thy lair mother, is dead with thy lair father. The old wolf pack is long since dead. <laughs> thou knowest whither Shere Khan went, and Akela died among the doors, where but for thy wisdom and strength, the second Sioni pack would also have died. There remains nothing but old bones. It is no longer the man-cub that asks leave of his pack, but the master of the jungle that changes his trail. Who shall question man in his ways? His words were cut short by a roar and a crash in the thicket below, and Bagheera, light, strong, and terrible as always, stood before him. Little brother, all debts are paid now. For the rest, my word is Baloo's word. Remember, Bagheera loved thee, he cried, and bounded away. At the foot of the hill he cried again long and loud, 
good hunting on a new trail, master of the jungle. Remember, Bagheera loved thee. Thou hast heard, said Baloo. There is no more. Go now. But first, come to me, O oh wise little frog. Come to me. It is hard to cast the skin, said Carr, as Mowgli sobbed and sobbed, with his head on the blind bear's side and his arms round his neck. The stars are thin, said Grey Brother, snuffing at the dawn wind. Where shall we lair today? For, from now, we follow new trails. And this is the last of the Mowgli stories.